Just press the let's go live button. So let's wait for the stream to fire up <clears throat> all across the fruited plains of the internet. Before we go ahead and get started, we like to make sure that the streams are working and alive and well. Of course, we're on Rumble, we're on YouTube, we're on Twitter, we're on Locals, and they're working, which is great. That means we can go ahead and get started. So let's do it, shall we? Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live. My name is Robert Govea. I am a criminal defense attorney broadcasting from the Valley of the Sun, deep in downtown Phoenix, Arizona. And today, my friends, we are talking about prejudice, in particular, the Proud Boys trial, day 36. This trial was not something that we were paying a ton of attention to at the outset. We've been covering J6 for a long time, and many of the other trials that we've been following have been really following this standard path. You know, it's out of the D.C. jurisdiction. It's kind of open and shut cases. We've been seeing convictions come out just like a bunch of robots out of there, just stamping conviction, 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 one after the other. And so that was kind of how this case was going up until just last week, where we learned that there were some pretty explosive issues that came out. And so we're going to do a quick recap of those, remind ourselves about these big issues. We talked a ton about them yesterday. And so before we dive into the new events, what's going on today, we got to make sure we understand what they're fighting about. So we have big issues about a lying FBI agent, allegedly, my words, not theirs. We have issues with attorney-client communications with the U.S. government snooping on the Proud Boys when they're communicating with their lawyers. We have issues about the new video evidence that was presumably just released that we all just saw. So we're going to talk about each of those. Julie Kelly, who we're huge fans of here, she's over on Twitter at Julie underscore Kelly too. If you've been following along the Proud Boys trial, you basically got to follow her. I mean, she's the first person out of the gates with a ton of great content analysis. She's got her hands on the transcripts. And so we're going to listen or, or read through some of what we talked about yesterday, courtesy of Julie Kelly. There was a new filing from the Biggs defense. This was a motion for an admonition to the jurors. You know, a lot of this case was really not really that much uh, in the news, but now a lot more people are talking about it because of what has been uncovered. FBI agents and a lot of malfeasance that I think is fatal to the case it is shining this big beautiful spotlight down upon it people are paying attention to it and so biggs and his defense they're wanting the judge to warn the jurors hey just a reminder stay away from the news don't talk to the prosecutors and all of those things so we'll go through all of that we of course know that the judge in this case is judge timothy j kelly we learned about him yesterday and then we're going to go through a really really seriously amazing thread courtesy of Roger Parloff. So Roger Parloff is on Twitter, at R Parloff. And I'm pretty sure he posted 193 different tweets. He basically transcribed the whole trial in a massive Twitter thread today, 193 tweets. And so ultra shout outs to Roger Parloff for being an incredible Tweeter who live tweeted the whole stinking hearing today. And so we're going to go through all of that today. It's the trial. They were doing a trial. I think the entire cross examination, he live tweeted it 193 tweets. And so we are going to go through all of it as best we can. And so, my friends, if you want to be a part of the program, the best place to do that is by joining our community. A couple ways you can do that. One is at locals at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. We do for members, no matter where you join. We do extra content. We do morning headline streams. We talked about the meltdown going on around the world in the banking system this morning. And so we try to, you know, stay plugged in and get our bearings straight on the day. And so if you're looking for some extra content and a great community, watching the watchers.locals.com is the place to go. And you get also all of that stuff. If you sign up on YouTube, you can click that join, mem uh, join become a member button on YouTube if you're watching it over there. Our Rumble friends, you have the locals button right next to you over there as well. So Everybody gets access to the private Telegram group, no matter where you join, so you can stay plugged in before and after the streams, and we are live streaming there right now, so you'll get the after parties and all of the good stuff. So thank you for joining up and supporting the show. I also want to shout out our sponsors of the program today. Of course, our friends over at Field of Greens have an amazing product called Field of Greens. It's real organic superfood. It gives you your daily servings of vegetables and fruits. It helps you really get the, the, the nutrients you need to metabolize faster, to have more energy, all the antioxidant capabilities in there. I mean, really good stuff is in there. And it tastes great, good going down. You can shake it up, throw it back, and boom, you've got your vegetables and your fruits right there. And you can go to fieldofgreens.com. 
Don't forget to use code Robert when you're checking out. You'll save 15%. And it's not just greens. They've got collagen. They've got sleep stuff. They've got it all over there. So go to fieldofgreens.com and don't forget to use code Robert to save your 15%. I, I'm, I'm, I'm promising you this, okay? The vegetables want to be eaten. They want it. And look, we're wearing green today. I mean, it's, you know, it's the theme. We love our green energy, not that green energy, the other kind. And also want to shout out my former law firm. Of course, I'm no longer at the r and Law Group, but they are still kicking butt in the state of Arizona, helping good people charged with crimes, find safety, clarity, and hope. And so you can find them online at rrlawaz.com if you know anybody in our beautiful state who needs a little bit of help. All right. And so let's get right into it. Proud Boys, day 36. The trial continues on. We're still waiting for the dust to settle. We had some pretty explosive issues that came out previously, many of them involving government malfeasance. And so I want to spend some time before we take a look at today's docket, recalling what the biggest issues were. We've got three of them that I want to dive in on. Of course, this is the Proud Boys case. This is a big, big case. This was one of the groups, along with the Oath Keepers, that were castigated, blamed for being these seditious conspirators that were responsible for insurrecting America. We have this big, hyperbolic, whining, screeching that we've been hearing for the last two plus years really has been centered around these two groups. And so this is a big group. And most of this was pretty mechanical going through the motions out of the D.C. Circuit Court. And then suddenly, boom, turns out this FBI agent Nicole Miller, this is just a placeholder photo. I don't know that this is actually her, but this is what we learned about her. Man, there were some pretty big issues from her testimony. And in one of the filings, I wanted to just recall that we heard that there were thousands of spreadsheet rows that were hidden from the defense. Remember, she testified, and then after her testimony, the rules say she's got to give a copy of the documents that she referenced over to the defense. She did that. There was like 20 rows in there. And when the defense cracked it open, they discovered that there was a whole additional slew of about a thousand additional Excel rows that had been hidden. Hmm, very convenient. And so the defense was saying, oh, that's great. We can't wait to talk about all of this because this shows that the government was hiding evidence from our defense, from our team. So that was an issue that popped up. We talked about that yesterday. There were also in those rows evidence of other messages that the government was saying, these conspiracy charges that we're working on here for the Proud Boys, they're pretty dang weak. They were saying, do you think this is going to get us over the hurdle of the conspiracy charge? You can see that right from the spreadsheet. Nicole Miller was saying all of that stuff. So we can actually go after them with conspiracy and not make a fool of ourselves is what they were talking about. And they didn't think that was relevant or that the defense should have seen that stuff. Hmm. There were also issues that showed up in those deleted rows, about 338 items of evidence that just happened to be deleted. Weird. Showed up there. An FBI boss assigned Nicole Miller, this FBI agent, 338 items of evidence to delete. And then there was another request about deleting an attendee from a note. Said, did you write a report about that interview, about that conversation? Sure did. Can you take me out of there? I wasn't there, but you were there. That's why I included you in the report. Did you hear what I said? I wasn't there. Cut it out. So the email says, you need to go into the CHS report that you just put out and edit out that I was present. Huh. So all of these were pretty big issues. And of course, yesterday... We learned from the judge that they weren't really allowed to get into most of this. The hidden spreadsheet rows, the government said, hey, those are classified. Those are irrelevant. And the judge said, OK, that sounds good to me. And the defense said, can you prove that they're classified or irrelevant or any of these things? And they said, no, nope. they just said they were. And that's about as good as we need here in this jurisdiction. We also saw that the conspiracy charges, they said, were just irrelevant, sort of outside the scope. They talked about the deleted items of evidence. They said, those are just old. No, those are old. They're like 20 years old and they're not even related to this case. They're not even relevant. So don't worry about those. And they said that you can ask a little bit more details about this confidential human source, which is what we're going to get into big time today because FBI agent Nicole Miller was still on the stand all throughout the proceedings today in this day of trial, day 36. We're going to go through that a lot. We're going to hear a lot from alleged liar, Nicole Miller, over at the FBI. We had another big issue, which we'll get into a little bit today, 
which was regarding Zachary Rail's emails. Remember that the government prosecutors and, well, maybe we don't know about the prosecutors themselves, but the FBI agents, at least, were talking about reading the emails and then notifying the prosecutors about having read the emails. And they were saying things like, oh, this definitely looks like they're going to trial because they're talking about it. And, th and they actually said that the defense attorneys raising some pretty interesting points and they can't wait to pass those inside baseball tips up the chain so that they could go over to the prosecutor. Insane stuff. But they said, the government, that, oh, no, 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 you signed a waiver. And so we flashed a waiver in front of your screen, which you see here in attachment A. And that simple waiver says uh, responsibility. I must abide by all the terms in here. The computer system is the property of the DOJ. By accessing the system, I agree to everything and blah, 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 true links. And by the way, uh, our corrupt government is going to be reading your privileged emails just so you know, tucked away in there somewhere. And so every single, I guess, defendant is just going, eh, agree, 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 just like you do on the websites or every time you install this, that, or the other thing. And then the DOJ just says, perfect. I guess that gives us access to everything. Do you see anything in here about uh, alternative? I'd like to talk to my lawyer or something. Is there an alternative? Can I talk to my lawyer app that they have over there to just ping their lawyer? I don't think so. So, you know, this is sort of, you have a captive person who's in your captive systems and they're saying, well, he agreed to it in order to talk to his lawyer. I'm guessing he's kind of got to go through this process. Right. And so his attorney was communicating with him and they were just listening in. It's disgusting behavior. Even if they had the legal ability to do it, it's disgusting behavior, right? It'd be like you going and getting the playbook of the other team and like you being allowed to do it. You say, well, they, they're using our locker rooms. They're using our locker rooms. And before they signed the locker room use terms, they said we they agreed that we could just go into their lockers and just look around at everything. So therefore, we're doing it. And they agreed to do it. And so, sorry, sucks to be them. Now we know their entire playbook. And if they don't like it, maybe they shouldn't have come to play at our stadium. Except here, they, they didn't voluntarily show up. They shoved them in there. In my opinion, in an egregious manner, something that they should have never, they should, these guys should have been released a long time ago. So completely captive and the disgusting DOJ prosecutors, or may, may, I don't know if it was the prosecutors again, what we saw were the messages from the FBI agents. So let's say the disgusting FBI agents who are reading attorney client privilege communication and then theorizing about whether to pass that up the chain of the command is so gross and reprehensible. It makes my blood boil, but they did it because what, what are the consequences going to be? We'll see what the judge does. There was another big issue about new evidence that was being presented from the J6 tapes that Tucker Carlson shared with all of us finally. And they explained, the government responded. They said, you don't, don't even worry about that stuff. It was all previously disclosed. And we don't know about this because we now have our doubts. We had our doubts previously about Shansley's first attorney. But you know, now they're becoming a little bit more apparent. We watched him on Tucker Carlson, not too impressed with him either. And you know, this is a situation where we don't know who got what or when or what the details were, but we're learning more about it. The question is, does the Chansley videos, does any of that relate? Does it pertain back over to the actual case at hand, which is the Proud Boys? So those were the big issues. I think they were very substantive, extremely frustrated yesterday that we didn't get any actual good rulings as a result of any of that. We're sitting here going, it's just like Christmas in America. Again, in this case, it's absolutely nuts because Elon is now retweeting. Free Jacob Chansley, right? Everybody's paying attention to this. The entire narrative, the fictional facade of the horrors of J6 are all starting to crumble down. That's why they're all petrified. And they have to, they have to put up the force fields to make sure that they can put a lot of that stuff back. But everybody is now banging the table, say free Jacob Chansley and, and you know, pay some attention to these people because this is a travesty of justice. Now, many, many Republicans are still dead silent on this and you expect them to be silent. But yesterday we got familiar with how the judge ruled. The judge basically didn't even let some defense attorneys make a record in open court, just said, you're done. You've already had a chance to file your brief, sit down. Somebody else stood up and said, another defense attorney, can I, can I support him so he can finish his record? The judge said, why don't you sit down too? And they said, you already filed your briefs. So Julie Kelly, as we said, does excellent work on this. And she is really, really you know, plugged in on all of these issues, following a whole slew of cases. She's got access to transcripts and she's giving some great analysis on Twitter. So if you're not already following her, please make sure to go do that. 
She's at Julie underscore Kelly two on Twitter. This is exactly what it looks like. And she's posted this this morning, March 14th, 6.30 in the morning, man, she's up early. She said, hey, reading through the transcript from yesterday's trial, Judge Kelly's courtroom gymnastics to give the DOJ whatever it wanted and to omit incriminating FBI messages from evidence is dot, 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 something. <laughs> Which is true. <laughs> it definitely is. The DOJ offered not an ounce of proof this message pertained to a closed case. Judge said, don't even care. Right. And remember, this is related to that first issue that we talked about, about this 338 items of evidence. So apparently this is a clip from the transcript, courtesy of Julie Kelly. She says that the judge said from the bench, you know, gosh, Judge, he's, he's really uh, mulling this over now. Hasn't already ruled in favor of the government, you know, basically every turn says on this point, another agent he, he's ready from the he goes, gosh, you know, on this point, gosh, you know. Another agent messaged Agent Miller that her supervisor had assigned her to, quote, destroy 338 items of evidence. He said, that's a weird, that's a weird message, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I, don't, I wonder what that's about. He says, but, you know, even though they said that, there's nothing in the record to suggest that the agent who sent this message was involved in this case or that this destruction related to evidence is related to evidence in this case. OK, so he just says, well. And she did say that, but we don't know exactly what she was talking about. So she could have been talking about any other case. And we're saying, yeah, or she could have been talking about this case or one of the J6 cases. And why is she deleting evidence? Can we talk about that? Can we communicate about this? Can this all be discussed in front of the jurors? Hello. And why was that in a hidden part of the message? The spreadsheets came over to the defense. Many things were hidden. That was one of them. Why'd they hide it? Well, they said there's nothing fishy there. The government says the judge, he's up on the bench. He says, you know, the government, by the way, I mean, okay, 338 items of evidence, but there, we don't know who destroyed it and or why they destroyed it or even if it's relevant at all to the Proud Boys. And he says the government, again, here, they proffered an explanation. They gave us a reason. The comment related to evidence, they said it was in FBI custody from a nearly 20-year-old multi-defendant trial. And according to the government, disposing of the evidence in this case is just standard practice, right? It's just what the DOJ policy says that we're supposed to do when the case is completed and defendants' appeals have been exhausted. Oh, that's all. He's just deleted evidence. So the judge is just defaulting to the government. Just said, okay, well, all right, just 20 year old evidence. And the, did you, did they provide anything to explain that? Was there any more details on it? Julie says, defense noted that FBI agent Miller's reaction was not consistent with just a general housekeeping matter. Right now, we can't see this stuff. We're just observing this, right? This has all been... done in open court and broadcast what I think is to an observ observation room where people like Roger Parloff, who we're going to get to next, are talking about it. But we can't see what's going on like we're able to see in the Rittenhouse trial or any of the other trials that we've talked about here. These are federal court cases, and so it's all behind closed doors. And so we can read the retweets. We can read Roger Parloff. We can read the transcripts even. But the defense is saying that when FBI agent Miller got caught out, called out on this stuff with the hidden rose, her reaction was not just like, oh yeah, you know, I sent you the wrong file. The old file had all the deleted things. And I just hid those. And then I deleted them because they were really irrelevant. I mean, I was talking about, uh, it was basically my whole thing, you know, my whole export from 2009 when I first joined the, so I deleted all those. She was freaked, man. She, and we read that. Nope, no idea what you're talking about. You didn't send those messages. Nope, 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 no idea. Here's what the transcript said. The judge is continuing. Uh, this is the defense speaking. Mr. Smith speaking for one of the Proud Boys says, okay, judge, look, this is just the boss that's being referred to ordering the agent to destroy the evidence because the case is over. The witness's response when we asked her about those deleted messages, when we asked FBI agent Miller about this, her response is entirely inconsistent with that suggestion. In fact, they didn't just delete it, is what he's saying. If this was merely like cleaning out the drawers, the witness's response, says the defense, 
in all caps, oh my God, insane, which we're seeking to make an offer of proof to the court does not follow. Because she's like, oh my God, insane. I don't know what that even means. It does not make any sense to say, oh my God, insane. I wonder if she said that. If we're merely destroying old tapes. So I guess, I guess maybe that came out. She's saying, oh my God, insane. Like she, she, they must've asked her, did you send this? Well, we have it here. And she said, oh my God, insane. That's insane. Because it wasn't housekeeping. It was actually, she had no idea what to say. I don't know. So the judge cuts him off and says, all right, Mr. Smith. All right, you, hold on a minute. Just so it's clear, all right. Everything that you've described to me so far, I either, it's either covered by my ruling as excluded under rule 403, which we talked about yesterday as the probative versus prejudicial test, or I would do that. So he's basically saying, I'm going to, I'm going to kick that stuff out one way or the other. Another defense attorney, Mr. Root stands up. He says, judge, sending an email or a text saying that if that was what they meant was my boss asked me to comply with the Bureau's retention policy. Let me start that over again, because he just chimes in here. So this is another defense attorney, Mr. Roots, I believe is representing Pozzola. He says, sending an email or a text saying that if what they meant to say was, quote, my boss asked me to comply with the Bureau's retention policy and get rid of some old stuff that belongs to a 20-year-old case and deliver it back to the family, that would be a good message, right? Like that would, that's what they could have said if that's what they were doing, <laughs> which is funny because that's not what they were doing, right? They weren't just, oh, you know, closing out an old file, I'm just clearing out those old bins, deleting some old evidence, you know? He said, well, they could have just said, well, they were returning the case file back to the family and all of that, but they haven't stated that's the case at all. They haven't stated the family. The defense says, can we ask judge for the record that they state right now what the case was and the family? Can you tell us if they're telling us that this is related to an old case, what case? Ask them. They say it doesn't pass the smell test. But the court chimes back in and says, Mr. Roots, defense lawyer, they, there's no evidence that they had anything to do with this case or anything to do with this agent, okay? It was just a spreadsheet row. We're talking about Jenks right now. So I, it's, I've ruled on it and I'm not going to revisit the ruling, says the judge. So if you think that material is coming in, think again, buddy boy. You don't get to talk about those deleted materials or what that case is. And the government doesn't have to prove anything because it's the government. And I guess this judge just trusts them. Now, this judge, as we know, was a former DOJ prosecutor for quite some time. He was there and got a number of awards. And so, you know, not saying he's biased or anything, but it's certainly interesting if you're going to default to believing, you know, I don't believe that the government is default honorable uh, it, ever, right? Uh, ever, right? That's sort of my job as a defense attorney is to always challenge that. No, no, no. We're not going to take your word for this at all. So the court is going to have to make decisions on this. Where is he defaulting? Can he possibly imagine that the DOJ and the FBI would be corrupt? I can. But he got awards from them. So maybe it's harder for him to do that. Now, Julie continues. She says, oh, and the 80 messages that the DOJ unilaterally deleted under claims of classified and sensitive, which we talked all about yesterday. The judge, again, acquiesces to the DOJ as to how to handle the matter. An ex-DOJ official turned federal judge, as we read in his bio, says, how does the government think I should proceed? Here's what this looks like. Mr. Metcalf says, uh, Judge, look, look, I don't know how to proceed in preparing my cross-examination if there's 80 different lines that have been taken out and I don't know the classification for them. So if the government is just deleting these spreadsheet rows, I, I don't know why or what for, and they don't give me a basis for this, I can't do my job. I don't know what to ask questions about. Judge, can you help me? The court says, well, so that, you know, the, the one, one of the hanging issues here is that the issue of the removed lines. Yeah, it's a pretty big issue, Judge. He says, I, uh, is the government planning, Mr. Pattis raised this last time, Mr. Pattis is on the defense, 
he's, he's looking over to the government. Is the government planning? Uh, Mr. Pattis raised this last time. And is the government going to make, and he suggested, uh, Mr. Pattis, that the government produce to me, or maybe to the parties and to me, but at least to me, a privilege log or something that describes the documents or the documents themselves so that I can review them. Or the judge is asking for a copy of the spreadsheet with the explanations about what the FBI deleted. And Mr. Pattis said, well, I would love a, a, a copy of that. So the court says, all right, yeah, let me just, yeah, that's the one I think, you know, issue here that is sort of left hanging. Well, how does the government want to address? Turns over to the prosecutor. I don't know what to do here. Uh, so what do you want to do, government? How would the government suggest that you address your deleting of, of rows of evidence? You guys deleted the evidence. Huh? What do you think we should do? Great. So what do they say? How would the government suggest that get addressed? It doesn't. Well, how does the government think I should proceed as to those documents? <laughs> Just turning it over to them. And uh, I guess this is what the DOJ finishes with. It says the DOJ says the deleted messages were either classified or they were about sources and methods. So they can't be revealed. And by the way, the defense can't see them because they don't have security clearance. Here's what they said. So that's what Ju Julie shares with us from the transcripts. And the court says, okay, that sounds great. Okay, so they're classified and they're also sources and methods. <laughs> and the defense doesn't have any classified uh, security clearances. And the judge is like, oh, that's perfect. That, that's great. That answers everything. So we don't even have to worry about those lines that you deleted on your own. The defense has some issues over it, but it, but you deleted them and you know better than we do. And we trust you because you're the DOJ and I used to work with you guys and you guys are awesome. Thank you for the awards. Good to be hanging out with you again. Welcome to my courtroom. You guys are doing great, by the way. Nice job. Call me after it's over. And they're, you know, judge, yeah, no, it's all classified. They're all looking at each other. All the prosecutors are like, <laughs> can you believe this crap? I said they were classified. I said that they were sensitive. So they're all mocking each other. And the judge goes, oh, perfect. That means it's like 80 rows, right? That means it's like 80 messages. Prosecutor says, yeah, it's about 80. Perfect. All right. It's, but it's, but so. The prosecutor says not the exact number, and I would not. I would note that everything removed was either classified or pertained to sources and methods, or the FBI internal file pass that would likely not be accessed from a browser anyhow. And none of them were even sent by Agent Miller, and none were within the scope of her direct testimony. And we don't believe any were required to be produced to these defendants, anyways. And the judge says, "Okay, perfect, great, all we need to know." And of course, that is the end of the transcript. And so. As, as we say, go follow Julie Kelly to read the rest of the story from her because she's going to close that out with some uh, additional knowledge over there about what took place. And so Julie Kelly at Julie underscore Kelly two on Twitter to read the rest of yesterday's transcripts courtesy of her. But let's turn our attention to one of the more recent filings that took place today. We'll see what the court docket had in store for us here. And we'll actually do a refresh to see if there's anything that has hit the docket in the last 28 minutes since we started the program. And no, so we do have a minute entry. This is regarding a witness who is gonna be, was gonna be trying to quash a subpoena that's been withdrawn. Yesterday we left off, we saw that there were a whole slew of arguments, which we're gonna dig into a little bit further because there's more cross-examination of the FBI agent. But this was the last filing you see here. This was a motion that came in from Proud Boy defendant Joseph Biggs. He was asking the court for an admonition. You see, this is what that looks like. Very short filing, two pages, filed on March 13th. This is from Joseph Biggs. His attorney is Daniel, Daniel Hull out of Washington, D.C. He says that a judge... New developments, news and commentary and lively public debate on that awesome live stream called Watching the Watchers Live, uh, just kidding, it says that concerning events on the Capitol, they've appeared in the media repeatedly. And now a lot of people are talking about it. Accordingly, Biggs requests that the jury be given jury instructions at the end of every day, saying that 
As always, conduct no discussion about any evidence. Don't do any independent investigation. Please avoid the media. Signed off on by Biggs. No, this is, yeah, Biggs is defense attorney going into the court. So that's basically the only new real filing that we see coming out of this. And so now let's turn our attention over to the actual proceedings of the day. And remember, we've got some of those big issues that we just refreshed our recollection with at the start of the show. And so Roger Parloff, he is on Twitter at R Parloff. And he's also somebody who writes over for the Lawfare blog. And he posted, I'm not kidding you, I believe it's 193 tweets on this day. And so we're going to go through it. This is day 36 of the Proud Boys trial. We're jumping in to the live thread from Roger Parloff. He posts the following bright and early at 5.13 a.m. And if you want to follow along, I did retweet this if you're following me. And he's over at R Parloff on Twitter. Excellent follow. Now, he says, I'm going to be live tweeting this puppy. And so far, we've got FBI agent Nicole Miller. She's back up on the stand. Cross-examination is going well for her, surprisingly. She's got all of these issues that we had talked about previously. But the judge basically said, man, they're all explainable. And you can't even talk about that. The defense is not allowed to introduce those bits of new evidence about the hidden rows, about the 338 deleted pieces of evidence, or any of those things. And so Roger tells us that spreadsheet gate which originally halted this trial, now appears to be a dud. There's one issue left about whether the FBI agent violated Zach Reel's right to counsel. The issue that we talked about earlier where they were listening in or reading his emails with his attorney. Now, they're expecting another issue to pop up today, he tells us. And for background, they say that Agent Miller, the FBI agent who's going to be on the stand today, she had her first interview with another proud boy. And this guy's name is Jeremy Bertino. And you haven't really heard much of him. He pled guilty some time ago. And he agreed to cooperate with the government. So FBI agent Miller is cooperating with Jeremy Bertino. And they're having this interview about six months before he pled guilty. So the FBI tells him, Jeremy, you know, your buddy, Enrique Tario, you know that guy. He wrote the 1776 returns document. This is catching up on some prior testimony in the trial. But it turns out that guess what? Agent Miller wasn't honest about that because Enrique Tario didn't write that document. So she takes this document when she's trying to communicate with Jeremy before he actually pled guilty. And she's lying to him. She's saying, hey, uh, your friend wrote this. You, you, you know this document. He wrote it. Turns out that might be a lie. Tario had simply been emailed the document by Erica, somebody who was one of his romantic interests, and the defense had been claiming that there's no proof at all that Tario ever opened that email at all. Now, that conversation had a big impact on Bertino. I mean, when Bertino was talking with the FBI, they're trying to convince him, give us your friends or plead guilty or you're done for, uh, work with us, cooperate with us. And they broke this dude. He did. He pled guilty and he cooperated with them. One of the things that broke him was this revelation. Your friend Enrique wrote that. He said in the interview, wow. He goes, You're, wow. What? Wow. That fostered in Bertino a false sense of betrayal by Tario. Never happened. But when, was, when she was asked about this, Agent Miller said some things that we hadn't heard before. Uh-oh. She said that after receiving the document, Tario Googled the Winter Palace, which was a phrase which was in the document, saying that, well, he did open it because he was searching some of the things that were inside the document and that he used the phrase in different telegram groups or test messages. And we have a great telegram group for all of our members. Thanks for joining and supporting. Now, the Winter Palace alludes to the start of the Russian Revolution in 1917. So the agent, FBI agent, said something to the effect that there was metadata showing that Tario created, modified, or addressed the document, and that after receiving it, he called Nordine. In any case, FBI agent Nicole 
insisted that she believed and still believed that Tario had some involvement in creating or revising the document. Now, during her conversation, during her presentation, they're saying this account didn't make much sense. But it suggested that at least she may have believed what she was saying and that she simply just dropped the topic. Now, so they just got off that line of questioning. So they're saying, hopefully, or maybe Tario's lawyer or somebody else's lawyer is going to spend more time on it. So great background from Roger. Now, the trial starts. Judge Kelly is back on the bench. All rise. Please be seated. All right, ladies and gentlemen, he says, all right, we got some briefing matters that we're going to be discussing before we get into testimony today. He says, all right, so defendant Zachary Real, who we read his motion yesterday, they filed a motion about the FBI agent. And we also had the motions we read yesterday about Roger Roots for Pozzola. He filed a motion to dismiss. And we had the other motion, which was filed about the QAnon shaman, Jacob Chansley, about the, the new video revelations, which were all the issues we talked about. So the judge says, you know, I slept on it. I had my coffee this morning. Here's what I'm thinking. I'm going to go ahead and allow the defense, Nick Smith for Nordine, to call a witness, somebody named Travis Nugent. He can come in on Monday. We'll start up on Monday with him, even if the government hasn't finished his case yet. It says that Nugent has long scheduled vacation trips. And so Nugent was close to Nordine and participated in the march. And so we're going to do him on Monday. Okay, scheduling. But now we're asking, okay, so now that that's out of the way. Now, uh, Miller, FBI agent, she's going to be back on the stand. And so the judge is saying, all right, we're backing up, uh, picking up with cross-examination here. And so the issue that we're about to get into is about confidential human sources or informants, right? How many informants were there on January 6th under the wing of the government? All right, what are we going to do about this? Uh, government, what do you say? So the prosecutor stands up. Her name is McCullough or his name. I don't know. She says the issue is whether judge the issue about these confidential human sources. You know, they don't remember. They don't want any discussion about CHSs. They want this all to be. It was just this natural, organic, riotous, violent insurrection that was led by these white supremacist, MAGA, extremist Republicans or whatever. And it had nothing to do with the FBI poking and prodding and funding and exacerbating and entrapping any of this stuff. No. So if the government has their way, it's all silent on this. So from that perspective, here's what this prosecutor says. She says, Oh, well, Judge, you know, the issue is whether it's appropriate at this time now in court, you know, to put info about these people into the public. And so we can't talk about confidential human sources. Everybody's going to know who they are. It's going to be dangerous for them. And so therefore, we object to any specifically identifying information, general questions that don't identify a person like, is there a confidential human source that's in the crowd? They say that's OK. And the prosecutor says. We also had this exhibit, Judge, I wanted to bring you to your attention. There's an exhibit that I'd like to introduce that Proud Boy A.J. Fisher and Defendant Nordine know each other. So Agent Kennerson, he says, I want to show this relationship between these two Proud Boys. Fisher was down in the Lower West Terrace, and Smith was also somewhere else over there. Now, Nordine, he hops up and he says, hold on a minute. They suggested yesterday that they didn't know each other. And so you should not be allowed to introduce that exhibit. Prosecutor saying, I want to get that in there. The defense is saying, no, you can't have it in. He's saying uh, that message, Judge, by the way, it's very inflammatory. It's actually racist. It refers to fried chicken. Uh oh. And therefore outweighs its probative value, right? So on that balancing scale, we ask ourselves is this more useful or is this more harmful? If it's more useful than it is harmful, we let that evidence in. If it's more harmful than it is useful, we keep it out. So the defense is saying, well, if you show this relationship between these two proud boys, it's going to be very, it's going to be very inflammatory. The, ju the, the jurors are going to see that they're talking about fried chicken and stuff, which is delicious. I don't know what, what's the problem with that. It, it's going to show something that is not useful. So the prosecutor responds and says, well, it does show that they're pretty close and it shows that they are communicating outside of the MOSD chat. And the MOSD chat was the Proud Boys sort of uh, like their Telegram or their Slack system or whatever. It's the Ministry of Self-Defense chat. So they're all communicating in there. 
So the government is trying to sort of take it out of the chat to say this relationship is much deeper. So the judge is hearing both of these arguments and says, all right, all right, enough already. He says, I agree with the government here that this is relevant and that it shows a closeness so that evidence can come in. But given the particulars like the racist uh, chicken quote, I'm going to rule this one out on the grounds that prejudice outweighs the probative value. So that one goes in a win to the defense. Judge keeps that out. Says, all right, it is relevant. It does show the closeness, but it is a little bit too racist. And so we're going to keep that out. And the prosecutor says, well, how about if I redact that? How about if I show, if I get rid of the racist thing there? Judge says, well, you can try and we'll revisit that. So then Carmen Hernandez, a defense lawyer who's representing Zachary Real, which was the issue, uh, the, the gentleman with the issue who had the government snooping on his emails. She stands up and she says, judge, um, during my cross-examination, I'm going to be planning to ask this FBI agent about those emails. I'm going to say, did you access Reel's emails to his attorney? I'm not going to accuse her of any wrongdoing. I'm just going to ask her just factually, did you access those? Just to establish the fact, not about whether she was bad or wrong or illegal or anything. Just that. Okay, judge. Judge says, no, Carmen, we've already litigated this. That's beyond the scope and it's unduly prejudicial. So sit down. We're not getting into any of that. Anything else? They all sit, you know, they're all sitting down. Okay, fine. Bring in the jury. Ugh, everybody sits down. Gosh, this judge is killing us over here. The defense attorney's like, geez, Louise. All right. So we bring in FBI agent Nicole Miller. Nicole, you're still under oath. You understand? Yes, I do. All right. Take the podium. Take the seat. And the defense attorney for Joseph Biggs, his name is Norm Pattis. It's his turn for cross-examination. He resumes. He says, uh, all right, FBI, Nicole. Is there a lead case agent in any of this stuff? She says, no. We actually have a team. We've got six lead case agents. He says, okay. Is one of those agents, Agent Hanek? Yeah. How about the others? She says, well, we got Kate and Brandon, Camilleri. We've got Dubrowski. Uh, we've got some others. The Camilleri's are married. We got a married lead. We got a married team of case agents on this case. What? Husband and wife? FBI team? Prosecuting <laughs> J6ers? Okay. Is that what they do with the FBI? Husband and wife uh, case agent team? All right. On the same case? Weirdos. All right. Now, so they say, okay, they're okay. They're all six of you are on this case. Great. Now, discussing a special form here. This is important. And they say, all right. So you've been working on this. Now, when you work with confidential human sources, FBI agent Nicole, you understand that you have to use different forms when you work with them, right? Yeah, we do. And there's a standard form when you do a witness interview at the FBI, and that's called FBI FD 302, right? A 302. You use those for most interviews, don't you? She says, yeah. And you also use a different form when you're working with uh, just not a regular witness, but somebody who is a confidential human source, right? Yeah. What's that form called? Oh, uh, that's an FD 1024, 1023 form, a little different than a 302. Okay. So different forms for human sources. Have you reviewed any 1023 CHS forms for this case? Uh, not that I can think of, says the FBI agent. And Patty says, you haven't reviewed any of those? Okay, she says, not a single one in this giant binder. She holds up a binder like this. Shout out to Marco Polo and the Hunter Biden laptop team and our friend Garrett Ziegler. But he holds up a binder like this and says, you mean you haven't read any of these 1023s? In this case right here, this one? Now showing her a binder, kind of a big one. Slams it down on the table. Does this refresh your recollection? Here, you can take the whole stinking thing. Here you go. And as you look through these, do you remember having seen any of these? 
Now, Miller, the FBI agent, she's on the stand and she's sitting here and like she's going through this big binder. She's like, oh, gosh. Con and remember, each one of these is a giant form, a giant like a form of confidential human sources. And so she's sitting here in front of the jury, just going through this go. Uh, no, I didn't recognize him. No, nope, don't recognize him. That's an interesting picture. No, don't recognize him. No, don't recognize him. Right. You get the point. All of these people are in the confidential human source binder, baby. It's massive. And the defense just slaps it down. <laughs> Boom. Anything? Miller's looking through a big binder of all the confidential human sources. Says, I have seen one of these so far in June 2021, but she's still flipping through it. This is what Roger's reporting. She's still rummaging through it. And now Roger comments for us, says, you know what? Guess what? Pattis has already effectively established by having her take the time to do this, and it's taking a while, that there were a lot of CHS reports filled from apparent Proud Boy CHSs. Look at that. Again, a CHS is a confidential human source on informant. Now, we are a couple tweets later, Agent Miller is now finally done going through the binder. I'd like to know what that binder looked like. I'd like to know how many different forms are in there from all of the different confidential human sources and how much time it took for her to go through all of them to confirm that she didn't know anybody in there. Can you see how ridiculous this is? How many of these confidential human sources were there? There's a whole binder full of them. It's the craziest thing I've ever heard. All right. So the defense attorney can't really dig into it, but did an awesome job of making them just stewing it right up there from the bench rummaging through here. Gosh, well, no, I can't remember any of all these confidential human sources. I can't remember any of these. Nope. Don't know this one either. Don't know this one. Looking through all of them one after the other. And then it just, you know, minutes go by. Don't recognize anybody. So then the defense says, okay, all right, you're done. All right, so you didn't find anybody um, amongst the hundreds of, of CHSs or however many were in there. No, I don't recognize anybody in here. Okay, so are these are then kept in a separate location, right? When an agent, the, the defense says, so when an agent or when a handler, when they get info, they put it into a system, don't they? And you say that only the case agent and the handler have access and they can send that case file so a normal agent can see it this is her explaining it so the defense says so you keep these in a separate location and she says well when an agent or handler gets it they put it into the system only then do we get access to it defense asks okay fbi nicole now are you aware that the binder that that was CHS info, that that was made available to the defense. Objection, which is sustained. Probably relevance or something, don't know. Now, Pattis, who is tall, is now getting too far away from the microphone, so it's hard to hear. Dang it, Pattis. But Roger's able to glean a different question. He asks FBI agent Nicole. All right, agent. I need to know. How many confidential human sources marched with the Proud Boys on January 6th from the Washington Monument to the Peace Circle? How many confidential human sources were marching with them? Agent, I'm only aware of one. Pattis says, all right, sidebar, Judge, hold on. Because remember, they can't get into a bunch of stuff here. So they're very nervous about saying the wrong question. I'm aware of only one. Defense says, all right, judge, sidebar. Okay. <clears throat> they hit the, <laughs> nobody can hear anything. Uh, come up here. They talk about something. We don't know. Defense comes back out. <sighs> okay, agent Nicole, did we see a photo of that one person yesterday? Yes. It was the individual in a black tracksuit, wasn't it? Yes. 
And there were no other confidential human sources that you were aware of from the Washington Monument marching down to the peace circle. Is that right? Correct. And did you make any effort to find out if there were any others? In other words, you didn't know or you weren't aware of any others, but did you try to find out? I mean, because you're an FBI agent, did you try to figure out who else could have been a confidential human source? No. Oh, well, why not? Well, I don't want to know. That's the handler's responsibility, and they're the ones responsible for the source and the reporting of the sources. So it's a not my job defense. Now, defense says, okay, well, before testifying that you met with prosecutors and uh, Agent Hannock, is that right? She says, well, Hannock was not present. And you went over these topics, and the government explained to you that its theory was objection. Judge says, sustained. All right. Defense says, all right, I'll try that again. Your understanding was the government is developing theories of tools. Objection sustained. Okay, I'll move on. The defense continues. And you would want to know, right? You would want to know who were the confidential human sources in the group, wouldn't you? You would want to know. Objection overruled on this one. Answer the question. You'd want to know the identities of everyone in the group. You're an FBI agent investigating this. You should be prosecuting people. You want to know the identities. And if they're your people as CHSs, wouldn't you want to know that? Yeah, I would. And so you chose not to find out who were the CHSs, didn't you? Well, that wasn't my role. You chose not to speak to the handlers then of the CHSs, right? Well, that wasn't my designated role in the investigation. Not my job. Okay, well, how many CHSs then were embedded with the Proud Boys on January 6th? How many confidential human sources were embedded in the Proud Boys on J6? Government prosecutor, objection. Judge says, overruled. You can answer that. FBI agent Nicole says, don't know. Five? Ten? Fifteen? A hundred? How many? We see the answer, no. And probably a ton of, of objections, probably asked and answered, sustained, sustained, sustained. She doesn't know, move on. It's interesting that you don't know, Agent Miller. You spent maybe, what, four months real time viewing video and different telegrams. Is that right? Yes, I did. So she was one of the top Where's Waldo players in this game. Remember that they put a whole team of FBI agents around on just computer monitors, probably, you know, iPads, something that they can use. And very simply, uh, you find the bad people. And they're like, okay, I can do that. And they give them a pacifier. And they're just tapping the screen to find all the insurrectionists everywhere they turn. And then they're, you know, doing that apparently for four months. Holy moly. And she probably had like a real high score, found all the insurrectionists. Real quick. So they put her on the Proud Boys case. Four months? Yeah, I did. And you studied, Nicole, background info too, didn't you? Well, yeah, I mean, it was a team effort. And you knew that the Washington Monument was a common rallying point. No, I didn't. Well, they gathered there, didn't they, on 12-12 before? I mean, they gathered there on 7-4, July 4, 2020. They gathered there Memorial Day 2020, so they're there regularly. You didn't know that it was a common rallying point? You're an FBI agent in D.C. What? No, no, not my area. No, I didn't know any about any of that. Okay. Well, so they pull up something here which looks interesting. A little bit of a graphic. I say, well, I want to show you this. Here is a Ministry of Self-Defense document. This looks like it is an excerpt from a chat which involves these individuals. Many of these people are Proud Boys. There's somebody in this chat called Johnny Blackbeard. This is a government exhibit, USA versus Nordine. Looks like a snippet of messages from January 6, 2021, the day of the event, obviously. Here's what the message says from Johnny Blackbeard. Posted this at 12.09.06 p.m. Presumably that's all accurate. And Johnny Blackbeard, who is John Stewart, who is not somebody who is in this case, not that John Stewart, 
that's his alias, Johnny Blackbeard. Somebody else, he's in the message, in the chat. We don't know who he is. Here's what he says. Uh, so don't anybody lose hope in this. We knew we were going to have trouble. And this is our first exercise out. And I'm down. Noble Beard's down. Aaron is down. We're, uh, you know, Henry Boy is technically down. Uh, we have a skeleton crew there uh, trying to do leadership and marketing at the same time. And uh, listen, we'll get this right. Hang tight. Try to stay tight. So this looks like it was actually maybe a voice message or a video message that they're transcribing for us. So he's sort of uh, talking this out, not typing it. And he says, we'll get this right. Hang in. Uh, listen, we'll get this right. Hang tight. Try to stay tight. You guys know what the original intent was. Stick to the intent of the plan. Do your best to follow the lead of the boots on the ground. That's going to be uh, uh, Rufio. Do your best. And we'll have an uh, after action report session. Okay. So an AAR. Put a pin in that one. An after action report session. What is that? Is that an insurrection meeting? I don't know. And we'll talk about what went well, what didn't go so well, and we'll make adjustments for the next time. Hmm. What does that mean? This is going to be an iterative thing, an iterative thing. So keep your head up and uh, do your best and have a good time. So this comes from Johnny Blackbeard, and we don't know who that is. Uh, but it's not one of the Proud Boys who's on trial here. Johnny Blackbeard or John Stewart. Hmm. So they say, well, what is this message from Johnny Blackbeard, Agent FBI Nicole? Uh, do your best. We'll have an after action report. They say, this is the date of the Capitol riot. Yeah. And it was a uniquely disruptive day in the history of the Capitol. Yeah. Uh, what did you think Johnny Blackbeard meant when he said that this is going to be an iterative thing? What do you think he meant? Objection, calls for speculation, sustained. Okay, well, how about this one? Uh, here's another message. Looks like these messages came from somebody called Nate Tuck. Nate Tuck is another person, and Johnny Blackbeard is also sending messages. Do you know who sent those messages? Nate Tuck sent those messages. Okay. I know what that means. Objection. Uh, do you know what that means? Again, calls for speculation, objection sustained. Apparently, this is a message from this person, Nate Tuck. It says, do you want total war? LOL, this is a mirror of the 12th. Exact same plan. Do you want total war? I left, I'm eating and chilling with my chapter. So we're asking ourselves, are these confidential human sources who are sending these messages? We don't know who these people are. Who are they? Hmm. Uh, not watching Trump? No, we decided to march like miles away. Well, I hope there's no back the blue BS because if there is, I'm going to hurt you. Nate hates the blues. And so they're all, they're all talking about, you know, big rallies and stuff. So then they put up another one of these. This one's from Stewart. What's an ARR? They ask the FBI agent. She says uh, it's an after action report. And he says, it, for like, for what? For like improving for next time? And she says, could be. And the process, the defense says, was that going to be the next time, like the next insurrection? Objection. And that is sustained. Okay. So presumably they're saying that this guy is a fed or a confidential human source, somebody who's in on the whole thing. Now here's another one. This one came in from Aaron of the bloody East. Push inside, find some eggs and rotten tomatoes. Do you think that when he said that objection sustained calls for speculation? How about this one, right? So what they're trying to do is show that a lot of these people were confidential human sources who were actually facilitating this whole thing. The conspiracy was being pushed by all of these external people who were in the chat who were all influenced by the FBI. Loving it. So how about this one? Pattis, the defense says, uh, Bertino, Agent Nicole, he wasn't there that day, right? Right. And they said that Bertino said something like, storm the Capitol, storm the Capitol. Aaron of the Bloody East was saying, storm the Capitol, storm the Capitol, storm the Capitol, storm the Capitol, is what he kept saying. Get there, storming the Capitol building right now. He said something like, go find eggs and rotten tomatoes and throw feces. Ugly image, right? Yeah. When was the last time the government was overthrown by feces? Agent Miller? Do you know? No, I don't know. Uh, well, never is the right answer. 
she should know the answer to that. She works for the FBI. But now they turn their attention over to some other images. He puts this up on the screen and he says, all right, Agent Nicole, your job as one of the Where's Waldo finders was to go identify all the insurrectionists, right? And so you were IDing people who were members of the marching group before, right? Yeah, I was. Can you circle them again for us? And so they pull this up on her iPad or whatever she's using. I was only sort of kidding about that, but maybe she's actually using one. <laughs> so can you circle for us these insurrectionists here, Agent Nicole? Show us where the insurrectionists hurt you. So she's circling them, but Roger Parloff tells us the screens in the media room are now flickering beyond usability at the moment. So we can't see anything, but we still have audio. So they pull up this, you know, exhibit 201. They say, hey, Agent Nicole, can you show us here where these are? And so she circles something. Uh, here are the insurrection. I ran over here, right, whatever. And so they move on. Now, Roger continues. He says, the defense continues. Now, you've actually identified more people this time than last time. He says, I took a photo of what you circled last time. All right, we're coming back to this. The judge scolds them big time for this, taking a photo. He wasn't supposed to take a photo of her circle because that would have probably caught her in a lie. And you don't want that to happen, of course. So Pattis is now showing her the photo that he took before. So she comes out here and she circles a big thing. All these people are insurrectionists, you know, the big circle. And he says, that's weird because when the government asks you to circle it in front of them, you took this and this is the only circle that you circled the first time. And it was a lot smaller than this time, Nicole. So why was that? He says that they counted nine on the first photo, but she counted 13 this time. And he says, okay, well, that's a pretty big deal. I mean, you're identifying people of a group. We're in court. We're asking you to be exact here. Because if you gobbled up an additional four people who maybe shouldn't have been a part of that, that's a problem. Now you're going to go ID four people who shouldn't have even be ID'd? He says, just so we're clear, agent, you know, these IDs are not guesswork. But in some instances, your identifications are actually clearer than others. Weird. You know, is that fair? And she says, what? What are you talking about? He says, in this group, you've identified members of the Proud Boys marching, right? Yeah, I have. You recognize members of any other groups? No. Did you study any other groups? No. So you don't know who these other people are? Is that right? Yeah. All right, I'm going to show you this. He puts this up on the screen. It's another panorama CCTV of the West Plaza of the Congressional Building. Giant crowd up on the screen. You can see everybody. Pro defense says to the FBI agent. All right, you see that, agent? Yeah. A lot of different people on that screen, right? Big crowds. Yeah, there's a lot. A lot of different motives? Yeah, I would say so. And potentially some confidential human sources in that crowd too, right? She says, possibly, yeah. Now, where are the Proud Boys on this image that you see here? And she says, well, can you let this play a bit? So they play a little bit of the video. The crowd disperses a little bit. All right, where are the Proud Boys now? And she says, well, by now, the Proud Boy, the group has dispersed a little bit. So she's like looking close and she's like, um, uh, there's one right here. So she's, you know, she's playing Where's Waldo. This is a big moment for her. She's been spending the last two plus years dedicated to this, playing Where's Waldo all day, every day, accumulated four months of time. I mean, imagine that, like a game, you know, four months of time, it's a lot, a lot of game time. And so now she's gonna have to show them in court. Find the insurrectionist. She says, I got one. There's one right here. So the defense says, yeah, that's one. That's one. Uh, but he says, okay, but that's three people. What are you talking about one? There's three people right there. You can't play Where's Waldo that way. You only got to find the one. That's how they try to sneak you and trick you. So now Roger says, we've got no screen anymore. So the screen's just flickering all over the place. So we have no idea what she's even circling. Now the screen comes back finally, crying out loud, our federal courts. Good Lord. So we just get the screen back. 
Now, she's made two small circles in the enormous crowd in this one particular shot. So the defense says, oh, okay, great. You've got a couple circles there. Nice job. Now, anybody else? Did you miss anybody else? Can you go find the other Proud Boys in there? Uh, go continue on. So she's zooming around, searching. Oh, yeah, I'm really good at this. Uh, Any more agents just searching and searching and searching. She's She probably does the pen method. You know, she's got her pen, like the pen method, starting top to bottom, left to right, you know, just working her way down. Now, she says, I know there are some here. I can't see them right here, but uh, but they're here. And, and based on other video, I know that they're in here. But I just can't see them right here. Uh, there's others here. We got Donahoe, we got Green, and we got Pozzola. Those are other Proud Boys. Okay. So you basically showing she couldn't identify them from that image. Uh, you see these yellow flags, Agent Nicole? Are these Gadsden flags? Yeah, they are. And they're frequently associated with people that are, let's say, protesting the overreach of government. Is that right? She's I don't know. I don't really know. Okay. Well, you see these American flags? I do. You see Trump flags in this image? Yeah. And you understand that many people believe that the election was stolen? She says, I don't know. Don't know. I don't even know. And do you think people there were supporting Biden? Don't know. Okay. So they're moving the screen around and says, uh, who is this person right here? Uh, uh, that one? I don't know. And you don't know who these folks over here are affiliated with either, right? No, I don't. Uh, how about this person with this American flag? Don't know him. And now Pattis is circling. Guess what he's circling? All the people right along the police line at this very moment, right? So you see what's happening here? We'll pull this back open. And this is what they are doing. The defense is saying, okay, so you circled, you found some proud boys. And maybe she says, yeah, this one's right here. I got this guy, or I got this guy over here. And then I got this person over here. And he says, okay, but what about this person? right here in the red. Who is that one? Any idea who that is? How about this person over here with the Trump flag? What were they doing? Were they part of the Proud Boys? Could they be confidential human sources? How about this person right here? No idea, no idea, no idea, no idea. Probably showing, and I don't know where the Proud Boys are, but maybe they're even further back in the crowd. You know, the Gazden flags, and who knows where they are? We can't see the circles on the screen, but that's essentially the strategy. The defense is saying, all of these other people, are a little bit more responsible for some of maybe what the criminality is in this case. And they're trying to blame the Proud Boys for it, showing that there is some good distance between the two of them. Really good stuff. And so as we go back down to Roger Parloff, he continues, he says, now I want to show you this video. He says that Pattis is now pointing out Ray Epps again. We've got a red camo type of uniform. You're familiar with Ray Epps, aren't you? Yeah, I know the name. Your focus, agent, was on IDing people in the crowd and what they were doing, right? And she says, well, my focus was really focused on the marching group leading up to the activity on the grounds on January 6th involving the marching group. So is, is leading up to the identity at the time. So this video gets played and we see this in court. Let's see where the questioning goes. And you don't think that looking at this man's activities might have provided useful context? And I don't know if we see Ray Epps in this video. I'm trying to see. There's pepper spray. But all right, so. We, I, I'm not sure what is there, but let's see where the questioning goes. So they play that video and here's what they say. You don't think that looking at the man's activities might've been useful in context? Says, well, it could have been. Now we see a different video. He says, all right, let's play this different video. Do you know who this person is? Well, no, I can't see from that angle. I would need to see a face shot. Oh, that's interesting. Well, you need to see a face shot now, but you didn't need to see a face shot on the last image. When we were looking at the panorama photos, why is that? Okay, who's this person? Puts up another person on the screen. Oh, uh, that's William Pepe. How about this one? That's Anthony Martinez. Who's this person? Oh, I don't know that person. Okay, so let's change the screen over here. 
And Pattis is now showing another CCTV camera of another lower stage area. Different video. Defense attorney puts up another video. Do you see any Proud Boys in this video here? Yeah, I do. I actually do. Okay, can you circle them for us, please? She goes up. The screen goes out again. The federal court screen goes out again. They're, they're the guy's in the courtroom jimmying the cables, all the old VGA cables from the 1970s. He's connecting those things back in there, strapping them together like that scene out of Back to the Future. And so the screen's going in and out. She draws four circles. No idea what she drew. Now he loses the screen altogether again for the second time, crying out loud. He says, all right, so I got to go back later. All right, who are the proud boys in this image? She, she says, okay, we got Paul is here. Brian is here. I know that they're in the marching group. I'm not real sure, but they're there. We also have some other people. We got Troy. We got Fonte Coba. We've got Zachary Real, who's charged in this case. We've got Quaglin. We've got Fisher. She's circling everybody. She says, I know that Green and Pozzola are also in this vicinity, but you just can't see them here. Okay, so how many people all together in this shot? Uh, she says, I don't know, maybe 15 of them. How many Groypers are in there? Uh, none that I know of. No. Do you know any Groypers? No. Uh, any three percenters? No. Any confidential human sources? Uh, not that I know of, she says. So then now the defense is showing a video. They take Pozzola. Pozzola is a defendant in this case. The defense is showing him breaking windows. And we saw the video. We played that yes, we played yesterday. We played it previously. Pozzola's breaking one of the windows in, and they're asking her as that video is going through, can you identify any of these people? Who is this person? I don't know. Who's that person? I don't know. How about this person? Don't know. Who's this? Don't know. She can't identify most of them. Defense says, have you seen a picture of a young woman who was shot and killed that day? Objection. And they don't like where that's going. So now, obviously, we're talking about Ashley Babbitt. And the defense is object, uh, the government is objecting, I don't, probably for relevance. They don't know where he's going with this. They have a sidebar. Judge calls him up. They discuss whatever, sends him back. Looks like that question is dropped. Go back and they say, okay, so we know that this person on the screen is Pozzola, right? The person breaking the windows. Yeah. Yeah, that's him. Who is in this video saying, go, go, go? I don't know. Oh, was it a proud boy? No, it wasn't. Okay, well, who's this person in this video? Don't know. How about this? Uh, that's Robert Geiswin. This fellow? Don't know him. How about this fellow? Don't know him. How about this fellow right here? Don't know him either. The judge says, all right, we're going to take a break right there. So he tells judge, uh, he tells the jurors, all right, everybody, we're going to take a 10 minute break. It's our morning break. So why don't you guys, uh, you know, remember, don't discuss the case with anybody. Use the bathroom. Uh, we'll see you back here in 10 minutes. All right. You know, so they stand up and get out. Then the judge sits back down and they say, okay, I got something to say uh, to everybody here in this courtroom. Uh, sit down, everybody. Before we go on break, I got to bring this up now. Mr. Pattis, who is the person we were just listening to, who was just giving his cross-examination brilliant of the FBI agent, he says, you know, we have a rule in this courtroom, and I'm admonishing you, we are not allowed to take photos in this courtroom. And he took a photo of her circles. Yesterday, she circled, these are the bad guys, and today she circled a much bigger circle and said, these are the bad guys. And so he was just comparing the photos so that he could catch her in her lie. And he says, how dare you take photos in the courtroom? We have rules in this court and it violates the rules. But the defense says, uh, judge, look, I turned the photos over immediately to the government. Okay, I took the photos and I said, here you go. This is what she circled, right? I'm not doing anything weird with the photos. I just took it for evidence. I said, hey, this is what your witness circled. Here you go. And I gave it to him. And that's defense attorney Pattis. And so another defense attorney, Roots, who is representing Pozzola, he stands up and he says, and by the way, judge, you know, if he didn't take that photo, then the government was going to be able to get away with their lies. They were just going to circle whatever they want to circle. And so we had to do it. And the judge says, hey, Roots, I did not ask to hear from you. I'm quite sure that Pattis is capable of taking care of himself. 
he doesn't need you to argue for him. So just sit back down. So then the prosecutor jumps up and she says, yeah, judge, it is true. The defense attorney did provide us with a photo. And uh, I apologize, judge, your honor. I didn't notify him that the rules of the court say that you can't take photos. And so the judge is like fuming mad. He's steaming. And he said, all right, well, if this is the case, then I guess that if the defense provided the photo at the time, then that is a significant mitigating circumstance, right? The judge was about to blast these dudes. He already scolded them and now he's going to, he was about to blast them, but because they turned the photo over right away, he said, all right. So the judge says, now I want everyone to admit right now in my courtroom, if you've been taking photos, who else has been taking photos in here? And so defense attorney, Carmen Hernandez, who's representing Zachary Real, she's like, oh, great. Oh my gosh. Judge, she raises her hand. She's, oh, judge. Yeah, I took a photo earlier. It had to do with the post-it stickies that she placed on the government chart, right? Because she was saying uh, this one here, insurrectionist here, insurrectionist there. And so she took a picture of that. So the judge says, all right, look, we are going to go on to this 10 minute break. Don't take any more photos in my courtroom and we'll come back in a short 10 minutes. And so they take the break. And of course, we just get to fast forward right through that and uh, continue on right after we take a beverage break ourselves, my friend. And so cheers to you as we continue on with our quick beverage break. Oh, yes, my friends, rehydrated and ready to rock and roll. So everybody used the restroom and they came back. They got their refreshments and Judge Kelly is back on the bench. Jury's impaneled. All rise. And we're back. Pattis, the defense for the Proud Boys, resumes the cross-examination of Agent Miller, FBI Agent Nicole shows up another image photo on the screen. And the defense asks, Nicole, can you identify many people with green gloves? Anybody in there with green gloves? No, I actually don't see anybody with green gloves. Um, is this person cooperating with the police on this video? She says, no, he's not. He's, he's hollering, right? Yeah, he is. And he's raising his fists again and he's hollering. He's screaming, Rah! and you don't know who he is? No, I don't know who he is. Hmm. Okay, well, can you identify this guy? No. Can you identify that guy? No. Who's this? Oh, that's Donahoe. He's lining up to throw the water bottle, right? That was the de deadly weapon, illegal water bottle that they indicted them with, that we've mocked here for years now. The weapon, the dangerous water bottle that got thrown. Yeah, okay. There it is. Do you see Biggs anywhere, FBI agent Nicole? Do you see him anywhere? No, I don't see him. Okay. Well, I'm going to show you another panorama view. All right. This is Donahoe and that he's throwing the water bottle. You see there he is. Do you see Biggs anywhere in that image? No. Do you know where he was? He was on the lawn actually. Okay. How far away was that? She says, I don't know, three, 300 yards, maybe two football fields, which would only be about 200 yards. Okay. So he wasn't anywhere near them then. That's right. Now, another video. This one comes from inside the Senate. Inside the Senate corridor, we've got Eddie, George, Biggs, Jackman, and one other. One of them goes into the men's room. And she, they ask the FBI agent, they say, hey, agent, is there anything nefarious about going into a men's room? No. And so Pattis is now, this is defense attorney, is now recapping all the efforts. Said, okay, so you've studied the Proud Boys and you've associates, uh, all their associates, you've studied them for months and months and months, been working on this for two years and all of the things, right? Right. And you don't know, after all of this time, you still don't know who all of the men marching with the Proud Boys are? Is that right? After all this time? That's correct. And you still don't know who the overwhelming majority of people in those crowds were, right? Is that right? That's correct. 
wasn't that your job to know that? I mean, you've been like dedicated head chief where's Waldo person. Wasn't that your job? Yeah. And he says, oh boy. <laughs> the defense attorney says, uh, wasn't that your job? I mean, you were supposed to know who these people are. Wasn't that your job? Yeah. He says, to a carpenter holding a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Objection sustained. <laughs> so he's basically saying, okay, you just set out to go find people. You know, you, you weren't actually investigating anything. You just wanted to go find the Proud Boys and went and searched and played Where's Waldo to go find the Proud Boys. Specifically, they needed these groups in order to make the scapegoats for the entire ordeal. That's why it took them so long to come up with seditious conspiracy. It, they, they took a long time before they actually came up with those charges. So to a carpenter holding a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Drops it, objection sustained. He doesn't care. He's done with his cross-examination. He sits back down. He just wanted that last statement to linger. So then we get another defense attorney. And Carmen Hernandez, representing Zachary Real, takes the podium. She's up. It's her turn. She's going to be cross-examining FBI agent Nicole. And we read through Carmen Hernandez's motion yesterday. I liked it, actually. It was a good one from her arguing that what the, the, the government prosecutors did by snooping on her messages, or on basically Zachary Real's former lawyer's messages, was reprehensible. So she, now she's up. FBI agent Nicole is still on the stand. All right, agent Nicole. Carmen says, you were the primary agent who reviewed Zachary's electronic devices and his telegrams, my client Zachary Real, right? Yeah, I reviewed his phone. I had the assistance of others. Uh, it was not, I was not the case agent on Real though, but yeah, I did review the extraction of the details. Okay, well, I have some questions for you at first, and then I'm gonna go back to your testimony. So in preparation for today, FBI agent, now you've reviewed many hours of videos. Is that true? Yeah. Hundreds of hours, you'd say? Yeah. And you met with prosecutors before you came in here today, how many times? Uh, about six or seven. And this isn't your first time testifying, is it? Well, I mean, in, in an FBI case, it is. And you haven't seen any video of real, my client, Zachary, break a window, have you? Or take a riot shield, right? Or break a fence or any bike racks, or you didn't see him destroy any property, did you? And correct on all of those. No, didn't see any of that stuff. And you've got no evidence of Zachary attacking anyone, right? Or pepper spraying anyone or tossing fence posts around or projectiles or even water bottles. You haven't seen any of that, right? That's correct. And you didn't see him physically helping anyone do those things either, did you? You didn't see him supporting them either, did you? Uh, not that I can think of, no. Okay, so thank you. Now, I didn't see that either. Now, let's talk about the timeline here. All right, the first event is a bike rack that's knocked over. This is about 12.53 p.m. She says, well, it's a little bit before that. Okay, so the next is a black fence that's knocked down. So the bike rack, then the black fence. She says, yeah, it's pulled over. It's not knocked over. It's pulled over. Okay. That was around 1.30. And she says, no, that was about 12.56, 12.57. Okay. And then there was a push right up a step of stairs. She says, yeah, that was about 1.47. And then there was a breaking of the window. Yes. At about 2.12. All right. Now, in none of those events that we just talked about there, any one of those times, is my client, Mr. Real, the person knocking anything over or pushing anyone down? Not to my knowledge. So he didn't break any window? Correct. So then they play this video. Now, Carmen, the defense attorney for Mr. Real, is now playing this video from 127. She's pointing out that they have not yet even entered the Capitol, though they're saying that they've stormed it, even though they hadn't been in it. So she's now asking the agent if protests on the Capitol grounds are common. And so, yeah, this looks like a couple of the Proud Boys here. And... If we go back to our chart, we can see that this is actually what many of them even were wearing on that day. I don't think we had a good photo of Dominic Pozzola. So that is Joseph Biggs right there. Okay, so they're having a conversation about this and they're out there and that video gets played. So then Carmen Hernandez is saying, 
how many, how often do people protest there? Are they common? Hernandez is trying to get into this line of questioning where they say that this type of activity, right, standing here and making a video like this is perfectly legal, which is the same argument we've made, right? And, and I don't know about this specific location, but the point is, you know, protesting your government is not an illegal thing to do. You're allowed to do that. So Carmen Hernandez, peacefully, is, is saying that trying to get into that line of questioning, the judge calls him off, says, come up here, sidebar. All right. Goes back. Carmen starts up again. All right, FBI agent. Now, there are demonstrations outside the Capitol that sometimes can be protected by the First Amendment. You'd agree with that, right? Yes. Now, I'm not suggesting that punching police in the face is a First Amendment protection. You understand that, right? Okay. And in Quantico, you were given an overview of the First Amendment, right? Yeah, we were. And what do you mean by that? What do you mean by the First Amendment? She says, protected speech. She says, well, when I was at Quantico, you know, they'll give you examples on a test. Like they'll give you examples. Is it protected? Yes or no. Uh, we're taught the first, the second, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and we're tested on them. Says, well, I may not have gotten all those exactly right. You know, some of the amendments, you know, I just, uh, first, second, fourth, fifth, sixth, oh, pretty good. Now in that video, I showed of Biggs and Nordine, Carmen, the defense lawyer, says that video, uh, Zachary Real wasn't with them, was he? She says, that's right. And so they separated at about 1.18 in the afternoon. Yes, and after 1.18, Real is pretty much with the members of the Philly Proud Boys at that time, right? After about one in the afternoon, FBI says, yeah, he was. And they were gentlemen who traveled to DC with Real. She says, yeah, three people came with him. Okay, now I want to show you this one. Here's another image. This one, we've got Mr. Real in front. You see him right there. This is government exhibit 401CC. Zachary Real is right up front. Isaiah Giddings is on the right over here. And they say, okay, Agent Nicole. So Giddings pled guilty, right? He's, he, he's already pleaded guilty on this thing. And she says... Actually, there's an objection, and that's sustained. Giddings traveled to with Real, so they don't want that to come in, but Giddings traveled with Real to D.C. on J5, and they stayed at the same hotel. Okay, so these two people came together. They stayed the same place on January 5th. Is that right? Yes. Now, how about the man with the American flag on his face? This guy over here. He also came with Zach Real, this guy, didn't he? And they also stayed at the same hotel. I mean, they stayed most of the day, didn't they? Yeah, they did. And then in the back, there's another person. Who's that person? This Brian, that's Brian Helion. And they're all members of the MOSD, which is the Ministry of Self-Defense, which is the Proud Boys chat. And she says, yeah, they're all members of that. And he was brought in by real? Well, I don't know who brought him in. I don't know if Zach brought him or what. But none of these Proud Boys, none of these three guys here were destroying property on January 6th, right? And she says, well, Helian and Giddings, they did pull down the barricades. But Real wasn't involved with that, was he? Well, he was nearby. Sidebar, they go up there. Nearby, but wasn't involved. So then they come back down from the bench. And Hernandez is starting to talk about Real and going into the Capitol. Says, all right, FBI agent. So he entered with Giddings and someone else and with Jeff Finley. Is that right? Says, yeah, he and somebody else also. And they were, Finley was the president of the West Virginia Proud Boys. I'm not sure where, but he definitely was a Proud Boy. And when Real entered the Capitol through a door, there was no alarm sounding. Is that also correct? I don't recall. Now we want to pull up an exhibit. They have another sidebar. Sidebar says, no, you can't have that exhibit. So they move on. So then Carmen continues. She says, I want to ask you about the member IDs and, and, and you identified all of these proud boys. Now, how many of them tossed things at the police officers, you know, and things like that, how many of them were violent throwing things? And many of them were doing that. Yes. 
And then you'd say there's a definite high-fiving or hugging, wouldn't you? Yes. But there's no video of real hugging or high-fiving any of those guys, are there? She says, I don't think that's correct. I think there is a video of Zach Johnson and others celebrating together. Well, which video was it? Well, I don't remember the exhibit number. Was this played in court or is this a new video? She says, I believe it was played during my testimony. It was when the police were trying to reform the line. It would have been after about 110. Where exactly? Agent Miller is indicating on a map, Lower West Terrace. And who did he fist bump? I think like Zach Johnson and AJ Fisher. So that was before the second fence was brought down. Now, the second fence was at 130. This was at 1256. So sometime after that is when you saw real fist bumping the people. Yes. Okay, well, I'll come back to that. Now, there's also a Telegram message from Stuart about their chat and the plans. And I want to pull up this video for you here on this camera. It looks like Reel's about to enter the Capitol. And this is an open door on this camera. She says, yeah, it's open right now. Okay. And he's coming in with Giddings and Helion and Finley and a fourth person, right? They're all walking in there. Uh, yeah. Correct. And there's no police officers in this vicinity at this time, in this open door, right? That you can see? No, not that I can see. She keeps playing the video. No cops still? No, no cops. Okay. Now, if at any time you see a police officer, you let me know. I mean, the door's open here. We saw all these people come in. And so if at any time a cop pops up on the screen, I'll just let it play. And you tell me if you see anybody, okay? And she just goes over to her phone and she's just like, Gosh, I wonder uh, what's on Facebook right now. Just checking around, you know, and then any cops show up here. Oh, no, you didn't see any. That's weird. Okay. Well, so, so, oh, here's a cop. Oh, there's one right here. Mm. But he's not trying to stop anyone, is he? No, not right now. He's not. No, because as we saw here, uh, there were videos of cops just sort of standing aside, letting people walk right in. So at no time, says the defense. While Real was inside the Capitol, did he meet with Biggs? Is that true? Correct. Same with Nordine. Didn't meet with Nordine inside? Right. And didn't meet with Pozzola or Donahoe, the other people who were in this trial. Is that right? So Real did not meet with any of them after he was inside or after he left. Is that right? She says, yeah, inside, that's true. I don't know about after. Okay. Defense attorney says, all right, well, I want to ask you about, quote, the Capitol grounds. Now, there are areas that are designated for demonstration, correct? Objection, sustained, can't talk about any of that stuff. Don't know why they had a prior ruling on that. So she says, okay, well, then you testified now, had to move on. Now, you testified about messaging between Nordine and somebody else called Lorkey. And Real didn't participate in those messages. Is that true? Right. And he's not a member of the chat? Not that I'm aware of. Well, what about Dan Milkshake Scott, whoever that is? He's not a member of the chat, right? No. Was he in boots on the ground? Not that I'm aware of. Are you aware that Milkshake had a problem with Zach on the night of January 5th? Not that I'm aware of. Now, Carmen says, now, was it your understanding, FBI agent, that Milkshake deemed to be rather irrash irrational and an aggressive member? Objection sustained, irrelevant, don't want to bring him into this conversation. In one of the videos, Nordine referred to Milkshake as an idiot. It appeared that Nordine was commenting on how Milkshake acted. What's your understanding of what Nordine meant? And he withdraws that question. They move on. Now, when Zachary Real entered home, the house was not in session, correct? No, I don't believe so. Do you know at 1.18 p.m. was the house in session? No, I don't know. Do you know when it went into recess? No. Do you know if the house was in session during the peace circle breach or the metal fence breach? No, I don't know. Which is a big element of this case because remember, we're obstructing the government proceeding. And so we're asking ourselves, did the J6ers actually obstruct the proceedings? Because they never even breached the House. It was only the Senate. And the House gaveled themselves into recess. Why'd they do that? So we have questions about that. Now, Hernandez says, all right, Judge, I think this is probably a good time for us to break for lunch. They hop up for a sidebar. 
the judge says, all right, you're, you're right. It is a good time for lunch. Attorneys, you sit tight. Everybody else, we're going to take a break until 1.30 p.m. And Roger uh, something something he says. He says an interesting footnote that somebody named Ron Brin pointed out to me. This morning, Agent Miller identified Telegram account. Do you want Total War as a PB tool, Nate Tuck? That's an apparent allusion to a notorious phrase used by Nazi Joseph Goebbels in a 1943 speech about, do you want total war? And you see this person is making a gesture like that. All right, so lunch is over. They come back. Judge Kelly is back on the bench. Carmen Hernandez is still cross-examining FBI agent Nicole Miller after a sidebar, and it starts. So Hernandez, okay, hopefully you had a good lunch, uh, FBI agent. Huh? Welcome back, yeah. All right, so we were talking about real fist bumping two other proud boys that you said he was fist bumping. I don't know. Hernandez is also moving away from the microphone. Hard to hear. So the agent says, well, yeah, there were a lot of proud boys. Real is there, but he's not near them. And so the fence says, well, whatever celebration is occurring, I mean, real is not participating in that, right? Right. He's not participating. He is fist bumping somebody. Someone's fist bumping, but it's not real doing the fist bumping. There's another group, Nordeen, Biggs, they're all hanging out, but real is not fist bumping. Is that the video you were thinking of? Remember before lunch, she said that she saw him fist bumping. Is that the video you were thinking of? Yeah, it was. Oh, so you were mistaken then. My client was not fist bumping anybody. You were mistaken. Yes, I was. Oh, slam dunk for the defense on that one. Whew. That's shout out to Carmen on that one. She's feeling good about that. Oh, so you were mistaken. Yes. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So that's what you want, right? You really want to uh, hit that one up because she got proven. It was in court and you can see that it wasn't accurate. So she's feeling happy about that. Now, Hernandez is now going to play a new exhibit. Now, this is a video of real just before entering the Capitol. Hernandez is having agent identify real and Jeff Finley in the crowd. Someone in the background says, Pence got evacuated. Says, have you seen this video before? She says, yeah, I've seen it. Did you hear someone say something like, do you want to go in? She says, I don't. I hear, uh, I hear Pence got evacuated. I think, I think Helion said that. She plays it again. Play that back again. You don't hear somebody saying, do you want to go in? You saw Real. You saw Finley. You saw Freedom Vi. You saw Brian. Yeah. And you didn't see Giddings? I think he's there, but you can't see him. Okay. And so the defense says, all right, well, both houses and Senate were in recess at this time, right? Yeah. I want to show you this photo. Now you testified that this flag was consistent with one that was removed from the Capitol, right? Right. This flag was consistent with one that was removed from the Capitol. But you can't tell if it's actually the same flag though, right? And she says, no, not based on the photo. And I want to show you a video of a crowd with someone throwing projectiles. And you can't say with certainty that it's from the same exact fence. Is that true? Yeah. And now I want to play a video from Zach's phone from inside the Capitol. In the beginning, you hear Effett storm the Capitol. Now, you said that voice was consistent with Reels on the video. Same term you used before when you said that you weren't certain, right? Uh-oh, yes. And so whoever is saying that, that's not the person leading the charge. And she said, well, it's hard for me to tell in the video, the voice is coming from the back. So that person is maybe 15 people back. I don't know what's causing the people to move forward. We get some objections that are sustained. Agent doesn't remember about that message. And then the defense pulls up another message. 
says, okay, FBI Nicole, here's another chat from John. He's a proud boy. And we have another prospect. Damon has a prospect. This is a private text group. This is not the MOSD group. Says, okay, how do you know that John's a proud boy? And she says, well, based on conversations that Reels had with him, but none of those were on the Proud Boys Telegram chats, right? So these people were just communicating privately. What she's trying to do is she's trying to show that Real is just outside of the whole group saying that these conversations with even other suspected Proud Boys are taking place outside of the official Proud Boy chat, right? He's not there fist bumping them. He's not even in the same videos when all the violence is going on. He's not even standing near them when they're doing other bad things. He's not even in the official Proud Boys chat. He's talking with this person in another chat. It's a private chat with Damon and John. They're all laughing. They've got all their messages. So then Hernandez says, okay, FBI agent. So it's true though that Real left the vicinity of all of the other defendants here at about 118 and didn't meet up again until later. So it's true then that Real and Pozzola were never even together. And she says, well, there was the marching group that they were a part of, but you didn't see them talking to each other. You just sort of think that they're in the group, but you didn't see anything, right? I don't recall. All right. Well, now I want to turn over to some phone calls. Apparently, Tario and Nordine made some phone calls with Biggs, but nobody called real. Nobody called my client. They were calling each other. Nobody called him though, right? Not that I can recall. And there were various videos and there were videos of everybody pointing all over the place, right? But you never saw my client pointing in the videos, right? I don't recall. And there were videos of people up on the scaffolding too. Did you see real in any of those videos? He wasn't in those, was he? That's right. Now there is this video of real. He's testing a door, but he's not going in. So he walks up to the door. Is it open? Nope. That's the video on the screen. Question, FBI agent. Did he go to the bathroom in there? Is that what he was doing? Was he trying to find a restroom? Probably a bathroom, right? Probably somewhere in <laughs> going to the bathroom. Did he go to the bathroom? I don't know. I don't know why he went in there. Now, Real doesn't have a radio at this point, okay? So he's not communicating with the other Proud Boys. I don't know. I want to show you a video of Real and Giddings and others in the office of Senator Merkley. So this is Real and Giddings. They're in this room in the Capitol building. And they say, <laughs> and they say, these other gentlemen, were they drunk? I don't know. This gentleman, he's smoking a cigarette. Uh, what is that? It looks like it's something bigger than a cigarette. Looks like a bag of weed is what he was smoking. <laughs> it looks like marijuana. Yeah. Uh, so real was there, but he didn't take any of the property, did he? Not that I'm aware of. And he didn't destroy anything. Not that I'm aware of. I want to go back to some prior questions about confidential human sources. Now you guys have CHSs and CHSs in the FBI, they have handlers, don't they? And so they show this video, he thinks. She's talking about a man that agents identified as a CHS yesterday. The defense tries to move evidence into, uh, move this video into evidence. There's an objection, it's sustained, so it doesn't come in. So they talk to the judge, the judge says, nope, you can't talk about that. So she comes back out and continues on. Now, in investigating this case, you had a number of text discussions with other FBI agents, didn't you, Nicole? Yes. And some of those conversations included my client, Zach Real. Well, possibly. Were some of those conversations taped? Objection, sidebar. No further questions for her. She is now done. Okay, so now we have the end of Miss Hernandez. Now, another defense attorney jumps up, and it's their turn. Sabino Jauregui is Tario's lawyer. And so he starts now. It's his turn with Nicole Miller, says. Sabino for Enrique writes. All right, Agent Nicole, you're one of the lead case agents here, aren't you? Yeah. 
and you make all your decisions together with all of your other five case agents? She says, we make most of our decisions together, sort of like a collective. Yeah. And one of you is sort of senior in rank in your little group. And she says, well, I mean, if we couldn't come to an agreement, we'd ask our supervisor. Well, who's that? That's Victoria Martinez. And what's your educational background? She says, well, I have a bachelor's in criminology. I went to the University of Southern Florida. Any training in computer forensics agent? No. And you were sworn in in 2019? Yeah. So you're still in a probationary period when you got assigned to this case. Is that true? Yes, I was. And which office are you a part of? I work out of the DC field office. And you met with the government to prepare your testimony today, right? Yeah. Okay, well, let me start with this map. Now, I want to pull up this map here, and this is the guy representing Enrique Tario. Enrique Tario, as we'll learn here, wasn't even there on January 6th. Let me show you the demonstrative map where all the people are. My client's not depicted on the map, is he? Because he got in trouble a couple days earlier, and he was not, he was ordered to stay away from D.C., says client's not there. He was in Baltimore. So when Tario was arrested earlier, they impounded his phone. Yeah. And did you extract the phone? Yeah. Uh, did you do a phone extraction? No, I didn't do it. Okay. Who is Kate Kane? Well, she's the expert in digital forensics and she didn't do an extraction either. Well, I don't know about that. Okay, well, so what did you do then? What did you do to review my client's telegram messages? The agent is thinking, she said, well, I've done a lot of these different extractions. So what I did is I took his telegram messages and I put it in an Excel spreadsheet. Okay, well, who sent that to you? I don't know. This case has a huge amount of digital evidence. Is that right? Yeah. It's the most in any case in the history of the US. She says, well, it's very large. And you would agree with me that digital evidence is very important in this case, right? Objection sustained. Now you're trying to build circumstantial case with your with digital evidence objection sustained. The exhibits against my client are Telegram and Parler messages. Is that true? Yes. And you can't testify whether the extractions were done correctly, can you? That's true. Yeah, I'm not certified to extract phones. So do you know who handled the extractions for any of the defendants here? She says, "Well, I know Reels." And we got a name out of it. Did you do any geofencing in this case? No, I didn't. And you're not an expert in Telegram or Cellbrite or Parler or Extraction. Is that true? Yeah. And did you take any training through Cellbrite or file structures or courses? No, no, no. Did you ever send my clients' phones to Quantico? I didn't. Who did? I don't know. So who would have more technical knowledge on this case? Would it be Kate or would it be you? Objection, sidebar. Now, Kate Kane, he comes back, is a forensic expert, expert, and you are not, right? Yeah, I'd agree with that. Okay, and so when you reviewed the Excel spreadsheet, you found that Enrique hadn't deleted anything, didn't you? She said, well, many people went through his phone. At least two people went through his phone before me, and they scoped it. And so it was the whole chat on his phone. At the time I looked at it, I think so. Oh, I want to ask you about the 1776 returns document. Now, you thought it was a very important document, didn't you? Objection sustained. And you used it to turn Bertino, didn't you? We read through that earlier. That was the document that they told Bertino that Enrique Tario wrote, and that sort of shattered his belief. He said, what? He wrote that? Okay, then I feel betrayed, and I'll work with you against the Proud Boys. You used it to turn Bertino, didn't you? Well, I did show it to him. You used it as leverage, right, to get him to cooperate. Well, I showed it to him to get info about it, but that's all. Tario was sent the document on 1230, afterward Googled Winter Palace, and then sent a text to Bertino saying Winter Palace, which led me to believe that Bertino might know about it. That's it at the time. And so you knew, though, that Tario had never even opened that document, didn't you? No, I didn't know that. Well, I want to show you this email then, Agent Nicole. This is an email from Inspector Kane. This was sent on November 4th, 2022 to Miller and Hennick. And she says there's no way to prove that the document was ever opened. 
didn't she? She said that. You can't tell if he opened it or not. And she said, yeah, well, there is no way to tell if it was opened within the Telegram application on the form. There would be a red receipt for the messages, but it doesn't say if the attachment was opened. The creator of the document was Erica Jenna, last created 122920. And that's what the expert told you, isn't it? Yeah. And so you changed your story then. You said that Tario created the document. Then the prosecutor corrected you. And then, then you said that Tario created it with assistance. So your story is changing a little bit, isn't it, Agent Nicole? I don't recall any of that. Well, I do. And I want to play a tape of your interview with Bertino back from March 2022. They play the tape. So basically, when you were sitting there with him and you said that Tario wrote the document, you were being less than accurate with him, weren't you? I believed at the time that Tario did create it. But then the prosecutor jumped in and corrected you, and then you said something different, right? Well, I said the same thing, but I just added a little thing, and I said, with assistance. But you had no evidence at this time that Enrique Tario helped create it at all, did you? Now, you also used that and the firearms violations to get him to flip. Well, I don't know. I mean, I just showed him the material. I don't know why he flipped. But this was a good first step, wasn't it? And she says, well, firearms were recovered from the search warrant and people cooperate for different reasons. All right. So it turns out, it sounds like what they've got going on here is Bertino was maybe a, a prior convicted felon, had a, a prohibition against having firearms. They searched his residence. He had firearms. They were going to hit him with weapons charges unless he turned. So they turn him with the threat of prosecution, plus a fake story about Enrique Tario. And she says, I don't know why people turned. People cooperate for different reasons. Nice. Uh, Agent, have you investigated where that document, the 1776 returns document originated before it got over to Erica, which I think was Enrique's sort of love, love interest? She says, my specific role was not going down the path of that document. All right. And so you didn't track down where this document came from? No, wasn't my job. Well, I know it was sent to Tario from Erica, but I don't know how she got it. And so Gemma, that was a lady friend? Yeah. And she kept hounding Tario? I don't know. And you know Erica hounding him and telling him she was pinnacle of female attractiveness. Who is this woman? Erica Gemma? Hmm. She said that she's the pinnacle of female attractiveness. Hmm. Curious. Now, and she says, well, I don't know anything about those messages. Okay, well, did you review the exhibits in this case? Yeah. Did you create them? No, the U.S. Attorney's Office did. Okay, well, who created the video exhibits with the white outlines? And she says the U.S. Attorney's Office did. They sent that out to a contractor, and then they made sure the timestamps were correct. And you've taken multiple trainings, haven't you, agent, on how to testify in court? That's why you're doing so well here, isn't it? Objection sustained. <laughs> Oh, uh, you're doing such a good job. Now, have you taken classes? No, but I've testified before, four or five cases. This is the first one with the FBI. And you testified as to some of the exhibits here that allegedly had my client in them, right? Yeah, my focus was on January 6th. Well, I want to show you this one. Objection as to scope, sidebar. Don't, doesn't get in. So another question. Did Tario create a boots on the ground chat? No, he didn't. Bertino did. All right. And so Tario sends no messages on January 6th to quote boots on the ground, right? He didn't send anything to that group. No. And Tario gets invited to boots on the ground without his consent, right? Objection sustained. Because it probably goes in. Yeah, it probably goes into some of the Bertino stuff. Anyways, are there any comms by Tario on January 4th, January 5th, or January 6th? No. Okay, so once Tario was arrested, there was mass confusion. Yes, there was a power vacuum. Everyone kept asking what the plan was. People were saying, delete the chats. At that point, Donahoe, Stewart, and Bertino, they became more active, right, after he got arrested? Yeah, and even on January 6th, it wasn't till later that Tario starts posting stuff. Yeah, he started at midnight, midnight morning on January 6th. Here's the exchange. 
Donahoe says, I have the keys. He's saying he's in charge? So Donahoe, right, they have this message from Donahoe. Yut yut cowabunga, post this in the message. I have the keys until Rufio and Zach show up. He's saying, oh, so, so does that mean that he's in charge? You know, I have the keys. I don't know about that. Now, re reading another, we can't see it because the screen went out again. They take a break. Good time for a break. 10 minute break. They come back in and now they're discussing scheduling. So Nordine and the defense, they're asking about rule 29 motions, which are the rules uh, judgment for of acquittal. Basically, when the government finishes its case, the defense is asking, can we move for a judgment of acquittal? Can we say that based on all of the evidence that was presented, they have not even met their burden. And so we don't have to present anything because they haven't checked the boxes they need to check. The judge is saying, well, I'll reserve ruling on those motions. So it's not necessary to build in time for argument before starting a defense case. Keir Kennison, prosecutor, says, can you set some deadlines for the defense witnesses? We don't know who they're going to call and when. Apparently, the defense has disclosed 80 to 90 names. Wow, which is just great. So their, their prosecutor was saying, well, can we get like a realistic list? Okay, they're not presenting all 90 people. The judge says, well, I'm not going to look at that now. Let's take our break. They come back after the break. They're back on the bench. Nicole Miller being questioned by the defense, Enrique Tarrio's lawyer, says, hey, on this message, do you see any messages or encouragement from Enrique Tarrio? Do you see anything in here like that? doesn't look like it. His name's not in the list. Now, there's also this conversation about an after action report, which we read through earlier. And you've seen nothing in any of this that said that the Proud Boys, Proud Boys plan to storm the Capitol. Have you seen anything that supports that? Here's another motivational report. She says nothing had happened yet. Could they be talking about just simply going out and having a good time? Like, could they just be talking about, we're going to go party later? Could be. Henry boy is Enrique? Could be. So there's no messages from Tario here. Is that right? That's right. Now, there was this other section about this mirror of the 12th. What was that about? There was total chaos on December 12th. There was no leadership. Right. And is that what that was referencing? And she says, yeah, that's what the message says. We get an objection that is sustained. The defense puts up another group of messages. They say in this, in this group of messages, do you see any encouragement from my clients? Yeah. And his face is still at the top, right? So that means he's a part of the message, but he's not supporting this, right? Enrique Tario is not jumping in and saying, yes. Let's storm the Capitol, right? Right. He, question was, he told marchers that if you don't fight, we're not going to have a country anymore, right? Yes. And then approximately 30 minutes later, the peace circle is breached. Yeah. And then he goes through a bunch of the other threads, right? He's just showing. Enrique didn't do this one either. He didn't participate in this one either, did he? And so on and so forth. Now, did you verify the metadata for these exhibits? FBI agent doesn't know what metadata means. She says, well, what do you mean? I don't understand what that means. Were you just shown the exhibits and told, learn them? Like these are the exhibits, learn them? Or did you vet them? She says, I was shown them. And okay, so you were shown the exhibits and you practice with these exhibits? Sure. But you never looked at the metadata to verify that they were correct. She says, well, no, I didn't. But members of our team did. Great. Is there anything you find funny about this slide? Puts this one up on the screen. And the prosecutor says, up, oh, judge, may we be heard on that before we get into this? Judge says, yeah, come up here for a sidebar. And the defense says, uh-oh, apparently I had an old exhibit. This is the new revised one that the government had. 
And so one of these messages was actually a forwarded message. Anyways, any, any of these messages come from Tario? No. Now another one. Any encouragement from Tario in any of these messages? No, nothing from Tario. Anything on Parler? Here's a public post by Enrique. Looks like a Star Wars meme. It's the Emperor. He says, he's a Star Wars nerd, Star Wars nerd, right? Well, that's what the photo's from. But anyone on this public uh, website can see what he posts, right? He's not communicating with anyone in secret or underground. No. It's public, isn't it? Yeah. It is, correct. Don't leave. Proud of my boys in my country. This time, Tario actually sends a message. You see this one right here. The gist of this is people were saying it was Antifa that attacked the Capitol. And she says, well, I'm not aware of anything relative to Antifa. Of course not. The defense says, all right. Now you've heard reporting about allegations that Antifa took part on the Capitol to pin it on right wingers. Isn't he saying that American patriots did this, not Antifa? I don't know what he's saying. <clears throat> A little confusing uh, interchange there. Now we get some phone records. Did you look at any underlying data for these phone records? Yeah, I did. Now, I haven't been able to find these phone records. If I show you the records, will you be able to find it? She says, sure. Is it fair to say that these records are voluminous? Yeah. AT&T produced 6,000 pages. And she says, well, can you just go into the file and just get them there? That's all the reports. She says, can I see the, the files? Can we go to the phones? They get on the sidebar. So they're trying to find these records in court. All right, go back to the AT&T records. Do you see it now? Yeah, I do. Where does it say the last call was collected? AT&T has multiple reports. Now they're saying that basically the telegram message were not recovered from phones. Okay, so the point is trying to show that these things are, have come from bad sources essentially. In summation, so in other words, FBI agent Nicole, what we're saying is you have found no messages from Enrique to anyone in any of these applications on the ground, right? On January 6th. Correct. I have not seen any messages. Now, is it fair to say that people were listening to Trump as they walked around the mall? She said, yeah, in some videos they were listening to him. And in real time, were people listening to Trump, what Trump wanted in real time? Yeah. If they were listening to his speech, then yeah. And you also saw people blaring through speakers and you saw telephones and you saw rioters and they were telling each other what Trump was saying, right? They were all communicating with one another. Is that true? Yeah, some of them were. And is it fair to say that most people in these videos, in everything we've watched, they are not proud boys, right? Yes. They're just large crowds, right? Just regular Trump supporters. Yes, not Proud Boys. Did you use any facial recognition on these videos? Uh, yeah, we did have a program for J6, but I don't know if it was used on these videos. Okay, so you have a computer program then that compares facial images to driver's licenses, right? Yeah. And did you use facial recognition to identify the Proud Boys in this case? No, we didn't. Did you use facial recognition to identify any confidential human sources? No, we didn't. And did you learn who Lieutenant Shane Lamond is? Yeah, I did. And have you seen any messages from Shane Lamond on J6? No. Any idea who Jack Donahue is? No. Jeff Carroll? No. Never reviewed any messages between Lamond and Tario? No. In that marching group, there were a bunch of journalists, Nick Quested, Army Harris, Amy Harris, Eddie Block. Yes, yep, yep, yep. How many of them? Uh, about five to seven. And you were on standby on J6? Yeah. And you never received any advance notice of what would happen on J6, right? No. The FBI, you guys had multiple informants with the Proud Boys, didn't you? I know of two, but one was not there on J6. And none of these informants ever told the FBI of their plans? Objection. Sustained. Defense attorneys are at the podium whispering. Pattis is telling Tario's lawyer about something. 
objection and a sidebar. Now, Agent Nicole, you first said that there was only one CHS on J6. Yes, I did. And then you amended that and you said that there were two. And she says, no, not on J6. One was there on J6. There were two working in the Proud Boys, but only one there on the date. But it's fair to say that there are a lot of CHSs in the Proud Boys. Objection sustained. Is there a third on J6? Not that I know of. So then they pull up another video. And they say, I'm now showing you just this little section of this video. Do you know somebody named Kenny Lazardo out from Long Island? Yeah, I do. And you know that Lazardo picked up Tario from jail on January 5th? Yeah. And he drove Tario to his hotel in Baltimore, didn't he? Yeah. And can you circle Lizardo in that video for us? Yes, we can. Lizardo, he's a CHS, isn't he? He's a confidential human source. Yes, he is. Okay, so now there's three confidential human sources? That's weird. It went from one to three. She says, no, no, that's who I meant when I said there was a second but he didn't march with the group on J6. But he was picking up Enrique Tario from his hotel. These people are the worst liars, man. So are you distinguishing the CHSs that marched to the Capitol from those that were only present on J6? No. Was there a third that marched with the Proud Boys? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, so Lizardo then is the fourth degree Proud Boy. She says something. We don't know what the answer is. Is he paid? I think they refunded his costs. Okay, so the FBI is refunding all of the uh, <laughs> CHSs. And you personally interviewed Lizardo, the CHS, didn't you? Agent Nicole? Yeah. And the reason you did that was to find out if there was a plan, right? Objection, sidebar. Judge says, all right, everybody, we're done for the day. It's been long enough. Says, all right, uh, we're done here. Jury, please go home for the evening. Also, avoid the press. Don't discuss the case. Don't engage in any independent investigations. Attorneys, hang tight. Everybody leaves. Judge says, all right, defense, what do you intend to do here? You're getting into this confidential human source stuff. Where are you going with this line of questioning? And he says, well, I was going to highlight that Lazardo was a member of the chats. The MOSD was on the ground. I'm trying to establish proximity to my client and what the info was. The human source, Lizardo, told them that they were going to a rally and a protest, and there were other CHSs on the ground. That's where I wanted to go with this. So the prosecutor says, well, judge, come on. The fact that he's in the group chats in proximity, it's outside. It's within the bounds of the scope, but the contents of the comms, it's all hearsay. It's an out-of-court statement. The defense attorney for real, she jumps in, and says, well, I'm going to ask the government to make available during the defense case every FBI handler for every CHS that we've talked about. She wants names, baby. The judge says, okay, well, why don't you talk about that with the government and then I'll rule on it. And, and Hernandez is now complaining. She says, look, this whole CHS issue is handicapping the defense. Nordine, Nordine agrees with the government agrees to provide the government with a witness list by Friday. And the government is agreeing that the defense case won't start before Monday. So the defense is uh, not starting until Monday. Judge agrees that the defense case will start no earlier than Monday. Smith says Travis Nugent will be the first witness on Monday. Real is now taking something up over the sidebar fo phone. And that is it. Recessing till tomorrow at 9 a.m. Hope to see you there. And so, my friends, that is the full day of activities on day 36 of the Proud Boys trial. And don't forget to say ultra mega shout outs to our friend Roger Parloff, who typed that whole thing up, spent all day assembling that for us so we could get the details. And so, make sure you're following at our Parloff over on Twitter if you're not already. But my goodness, my friends, that was a lot of activity, some interesting stuff. You can see we covered day 36 in full. We learned about some of the most recent filings from Biggs. We got the latest on the transcripts from our friend Julie Kelly. 
and we learned all about some of the biggest issues that are still in play, including issues with FBI agent Nicole Miller, attorney-client communications snooped on by the government, new J6 videos that are altering the equation, and we covered a ton. And so now it is time to hear from you and to see what you have to say about this from our friends at watchingthewatchers.locals.com, from our friends over on YouTube, on Rumble, and all of the other places. But before we get there, my goodness, I almost forgot to remind us all about being healthy and eating our greens because we would all like to lose some of those leftover pandemic pounds, but we're all sick of all the weight loss pills and fad diets. We've all been there. We've all done that. And we know that they don't work, but you know what does? Eating five healthy servings of fruits and vegetables every day. You do that and the weight would probably just fall right off. But look, vegetables, not a fan. Fruits, who's got time to prepare that every day instead? Let's talk about Field of Greens. Now, Field of Greens is a science-backed formula of very specific fruits and vegetables that you're not gonna find in any other product. We know that proper nutrition reboots your metabolism so you can burn calories faster and lose weight the healthier way. And Field of Greens is the only brand backed by a better health promise. Yes, you're gonna look healthier and feel healthier, but the greater proof is gonna come at the next checkup when your doctor says, wow, you've lost weight. Whatever you're doing, keep it up. And so let's get you started. Go on over to fieldofgreens.com. Don't forget to use code Robert at checkout so you can save 15% on your order. They've got greens, they've got collagen, they've got sleep stuff, all sorts of good stuff at fieldofgreens.com. The vegetables want to be eaten and you will feel great and bursting with green energy, the good kind that we all love. And so thank you for supporting our sponsors and, and being healthy too. The vegetables want to be eaten. All right, and so, we are queuing up some great comments and questions. And I saw some membership gifts that came in. And I'm not sure if I can see those, but I do appreciate them. Let's see what I can see. Here is what we have in the house. Fred Pedamonte is in the house. He says, Rob, and Fred, Fred's dog, Johnny, is just out of control. Oh, my gosh. Rob, Johnny's not happy. He sent you a $5 super chat yesterday about emailing you, but you didn't read it. He's been barking all day. What's your email? I'm pretty sure I have your email, Fred. Uh, Johnny's email. Did I get an email from Johnny or Fred? I don't know. I think I got one from Fred, but maybe Johnny sent one. But it's robert at spotlightlawyer.com. If I haven't responded to you, Fred, I will, I will do that in short order. I apologize. I do love Johnny. Johnny's great. We're happy to have Johnny on the show. And I don't want him barking all day, man. He's a real good boy. And so we'll read the email and then we'll give him some good belly rubs. Give him my apologies and maybe take him on an extra walk for us. I appreciate you being here, Fred. I really do appreciate it. And hey, we had Dolphin Fan. Thank you, Dolphin Fan, who gifted memberships. Oh my goodness. Brian, Ryan, Brian, Carol, Raul, Boz, Just Jeremy, Saintly, Lenny, Danielle, Eric, Sandy, Nixie. Juanita and Allison, oh my goodness, all becoming members courtesy of our friend DolphinFan73. What an amazing gift. Thank you, Dolphin Fan. And so for members, we do morning-only headlines. We do extra content. We did a, a show this morning. We'll do another one tomorrow morning because there's too much news to get to. We can't squeeze it all in here. And so come and join us. And uh, we got 10 new people courtesy of Dolphin Fan, all joining us. Thank you very much, Dolphin Fan. Here, one from Zulu came in, says, Rob, as a licensed attorney, would you say the judge has done things illegally or just distastefully to certain people? It seems to be a point of contention. Well, uh, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't say anything illegal th that we have seen because the judge has a ton of discretion and has full capability to make these rulings and there's no real you know, criminal law that would, you could charge him on. I mean, I, I theoretically you could, but you know, they're not going to charge him from doing something within the bounds of his discretion. He's going to be immune from all of those decisions. The, the, you know, the better mechanism of challenging it would be to appeal it. And there's also things you could do. I mean, you could file bar complaints or, or uh, judicial complaints against judges. And I, you know, I don't think it's going to go anywhere. I don't think that what this judge has been doing has been outright illegal, right? In any in any way, but I 
it is distasteful. So if Zulu, if you're giving me those two options, I would say it's distasteful and not illegal. But I'll leave it there. I'll leave it there. It, it is a federal judge. And of course, they have a lot of power and a lot of discretion and a lot of immunity for a lot of distasteful things, but that doesn't make them illegal. Good question from Zulu, and thank you for the chat. Third proverb says, do RICO statutes apply to corrupt government organizations? Uh, so you're asking if you can prosecute the government as a corrupt organization? No, unfortunately not. The, the mechanism by which you can, you can lodge your complaints with the government, the government will tell you, or the, the courts will tell you, is voting. You just vote differently. And if you don't like a ruling out of a lower level court, you appeal it. And if you don't like any of that, you got to vote a different legislature and to change the judiciary. I mean, the judiciary is pretty well insulated against a lot of recourse for good reason, because you really don't want them to be flying around at the whims of, you know, democracy. You really want something that's a little bit more steadfast, an institution that doesn't waver with everybody else, right? Congress flops all over the place. The executive branch flops all over the place. And so you want these institutions to have a little bit more heft to them so they don't waffle, you know, waffle around. But in DC, you know, I don't know what the remedy is out of DC. I mean, I think really the remedy uh, was a solution proposed by Newt Gingrich a long time ago when we were dealing with the Ninth Circuit, which was to just get rid of the Ninth Circuit. Just, you know, you can legislate the jurisdiction of the courts through the legislative branch. So in other, in other words, Congress can set the jurisdiction of the courts. And if you got a big enough Congress, you just get rid of the DC circuit, which I think would be a good call because it's basically a training ground for Supreme Court justices anyways. So just get rid of the DC circuit and disband all of it. Because it, it, in my opinion, it feels like a very one-sided jurisdiction. And a lot of these rulings, I vehemently disagree with. I think that what we've seen is a miscarriage of justice, but that's my opinion on that. And the judge is not going to be criminally liable for it. And the, 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 right, the right remedy is to wake more people up and, and you know, vote in a new legislature that, that, re, that fixes the judiciary. Honestly, it's a tall order. Or just don't go to D.C. and don't get prosecuted there. Stay out of D.C. A plus computer services says, is there a constitutional right tied to a fair trial that this joke of a judge hasn't egregiously violated? Uh, there is a constitutional right to a fair trial. We have due process uh, issues that I think have popped up here. There's confrontation issues that I think have popped up here. I think that there are uh, evidentiary matters that should have been admitted and discussed, but the judge has the discretion to allow them in or not. And this will just work its way up to the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. And do you think that they're going to change anything? <laughs> I don't, unfortunately. Hey, another one from Fred says, Rob, Johnny's been drinking Grey Goose and tonic all day. My goodness, all day. I wonder what time he started. He was talking to Tucker Carlson. Tucker had to stand down on January 6th. He had a segment on Ray Epps <laughs> from Fred. So Johnny's getting hammered. They're talking about J6 videos. Is he depressed? I mean, he's hanging out with Tucker. I don't think Tucker drinks. So Tucker had to stand down on, I guess they're just depressed. Maybe Johnny wanted some of his greatest hits to come out. Is that why? He wanted everybody to see his great work on that day. Is he responsible for the insurrection? Is that the Johnny? who's in the Telegram messages that we just read. I think that's it. We cracked the code. Uh, Zulu is here, wants an MTG GIF, preferably post Kentucky Derby era. <laughs> oh, no. And he put a horse emoji, Zulu. MTG with a horse emoji from Zulu. We can do a Marjorie Taylor Green GIF. I don't know what, I don't know what you're talking about with a horse emoji or Kentucky Derby. I don't get it. Just Cause says, wouldn't CI's confidential informants not be named or testifying inhibit the right to confront your accuser? It sounds like it would to me. Yes, I mean, it, it, it depends. Yes, it certainly depends on that. Like if the, if the accuser is going to be actually accusing you of something and they're going to use that accusation as evidence, then you would have the right to, to confront that accuser. I don't think that they're using them in that way in this case. They're using them tangentially so that they don't have to actually use them. So 
they're using more direct evidence. In other words, they're not trying to use an accuser or a CHS to prove any of the elements of the crime. They say, we've got everything else to prove that we've got uh, their own messages, their own messages amongst each other. We've got their physical presence. We've got other surveillance footage, you know, and all of these other things. So they don't need those people. But if they did need them because they witnessed or observed something, then yeah, they would be brought in and you'd be able to confront them. Uh, what is your preferred small arms caliber if you had to pick one? Uh, 40, I would say is probably, I uh, I own the most 40 caliber of, of all other types. So 40 would be my default. From Bird Shadow, another great question. And so very grateful for our friends on YouTube, for all of the super chats, for all of the memberships. And I think that there were some other memberships that came in, but they flew past my screen. I think Zulu maybe gave some memberships. Zulu, thank you for that. And I don't think that I can actually even see those, which I can just see the people who came in, but I can't tell who bought them. So, so I missed you. I apologize. I'll try to get better about that. I think I, I think I saw him from Zulu and from some others, but I very much appreciate you. Welcome to all of our new members. We're grateful to have you. But now, my friends, let's also turn our attention over to our friends on Twitter and our Rumble friends and say hello to everybody over there in the chat. Who's over there? Member of the public. We got little galaxies in the house. Jan X over there. Wait a minute. Did the stream not start on Rumble? I don't know. Maybe it didn't start over there. I, I guess I don't see anything over there. Did we not start on Rumble? Oh, man. That's going to be a bummer if that's true. Oh, no. We're live on Rumble. I just had to do a refresh. Colt 40s. Oh, we're over here. Yeah. All right. It's working now. MTG's over there. or uh, Little Galaxy. NC Native. Cell Rin is over there. Says, yeah, it's very much alive. Yeah, cool. Rumble. I just had to do a refresh. Good to see our Rumble friends over there. Everybody in the house. Let's also turn our attention over to Twitter and see what type of activity we have. And we have some good activity. In fact, we have a whopping two viewers over there, which is out of control. So you can see here a couple messages from Andy, who's a good follow on Twitter. Andy P 1989 says, one of the worst things the Bush administration did was transition the FBI from a law enforcement agency responsible for crimes that took place in multiple jurisdictions to an intelligence agency. And I agree with that. A lot of problematic things. James Pepper is posting over there. Paul Me No says there are feds in the chat. Paul Me No at Sleepy Dog Lee says there are feds in the chat. And this is a grip strength video, which we'll uh, leave there. Here's another one from Paul Me No. He says this one is lies that there were no viewers, but obviously somebody had to be viewing it if you were going to be taking the screenshot. And says, yeah, Twitter is shadow banning you. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Uh, you know, wouldn't surprise me. Everybody else is. What's the problem? Hey, you can't handle the truth. I like that one from Salt Farmer. Adams over here says roll call, but I'm late. Dapper Dan says, love the presentations, doing a service to our country. Well, thank you, Dapper. We're trying to be useful here, trying to help everybody understand what is going on and what a joke a lot of this really is. And so those are our friends. And thank you, everybody, for being a part of the program here today. We are going to leave it there. We're going over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com for our after party. And we hope to see you there. The address is watchingthewatchers.locals.com. If you're a member on YouTube or elsewhere, don't forget to sign up and join the Telegram group, which is in the link wherever you are tuning in from. Also, check out fieldofgreens.com. You can save 15% with code Robert. Get your field of greens and eat. Your fruits and vegetables, my friends, the vegetables want to be eaten. Also, want to shout out my former law firm, our friends over at the r, &R Law Group, 480-787-0394, online at rrlawaz.com. One final shout out to our mods and meme smiths who hold the fort down for us on the program. Shout outs to Vienti Kiss Prime, our friend K Bean, Just Cause, playing hooky. We've got Ronnie Cole, Zulu's in the chat, our friend Geomancy Games, Zach Nichols, 
and John Allen, of course, on Locals, our meme smiths, Jigum Gigum, and Sleepy Dog Lee over on Twitter. But that, my friends, is it for us on the day. We are going to come back tomorrow morning for our members to do the morning show. Hope to see you there. But if not, we'll be back same time here to do this show all again. And we look forward to seeing you there so that together with your help, we can shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding justice. Have a beautiful night, my friends. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Bye-bye.